Welcome back, everyone, from lunch. Go ahead and get started with this afternoon's agenda items. Let's start with the plans for the council to adopt the 2024-2026 Spunny Dog Fit specifications. Jason, are you ready? I think so. Stephen, can you just... Uh... Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, so these are the topics that I'm going to run through a bit of uh, management history summary assessment summary um, run through the advisory panel input. Um, Paul Rago's online will give us some um, summary from the SSC meeting and then move on to um, staff and monitoring committee recommendations. And we do have, we did have a committee meeting. And we do have a, a committee motion. Just a few acronyms will pop up over and over in this presentation. We've got the SSC, acceptable biological catch comes from the SSC, the upper binding limit on catch. Uh, for spiny dogfish, we take off a bit for Canada. Um, we'll refer to the advisory panel a lot, and I'll bop, um, pop back and forth a bit between metric tons and pounds. Um, but I think that the easy way is about 450 metric tons is about a million pounds. So current management summary. Um, so we've had the plan since about 2000. It's an open access fishery. The 7,500 pound federal trip limit and federal waters totally close once we hit the uh, federal quota. It's a joint plan with New England. So I'll go up to New England for their next um, council meeting. If the two councils disagree, NIMS has pretty wide latitude to resolve any differences. It's also complementary management with the commission. Um, in recent years, they've been pretty much aligned with the councils, um, but it's not joint. They, um, they can potentially, um, they don't necessarily have to follow along with exactly what the council does. So these are our current specifications. Again, we start with the ABC, we take out for Canada, for there's no management uncertainty buffer. Um, we take out for discards, rec landings, and we're at a 12 million pound commercial quota currently. Uh, just um, history of fishery removals. I think this actually might be, it's not removals. I think the discards here are not dead discards, um, but, um, but you can kind of get a sense of trends and landings and discards over time. So, you know, big picture with the assessment, especially since rebuilding around, you know, when we started in 2000 under rebuilding, and by 2010, you know, 2011, 12, the stock had increased, SSB, or the, the biomass had increased, which is in our current um, kind of currency is, is, is spawning production pups, but we were off. And in 2016, if you look at the F rates that we think they're now, we had the quota about four times too high. Um, so now we're kind of dealing with the aftermath of that. So this is what the assessment thinks the trends in biomass have been. You can see, you know, looking towards the most recent years, that bump up when we were under rebuilding and then um, since about 2012, a decline back to about where we were in 2000. Um, but um, productivity has changed. So we actually think we're about at the target, even though we're near the low point in the time series. We'll talk about some of the implications of that in, in a few slides here. Uh, so this is just F um, overfishing for a good bit of the time series here. Um, in the most recent year, not overfishing though. So we're just about in 2022, we're like right about at the target and a little bit um, below the overfishing threshold. So let's see here. Okay. Um, so the green along the, the bottom there, those are the periods where we weren't overfishing, um, hand drawn in, just approximate there. Um, the research track had our target where that higher dotted green line is. Um, but with the management track assessment that we just had, it concluded that productivity was lower, so it lowered that reference point. Um, so it's it's a kind of a double-edged sword. We're at our target, but since it's less productive, we get less fish out of it. 
um, and maybe only around 7,000 metric tons. So that compares to in 2022, our ABC was 17 and a half thousand metric tons. And in 2023, we more or less eyeballed where we thought we were gonna end up to try to kind of um, get there once we had a, you know, the writing was on the wall with the, with the research track. And so 2022, 2023, um, we kind of front loaded most of the reductions in, in 2023. So re recent performance, um, this is just uh, landings versus quota. Um, so since 2000, uh, so landings were low in that rebuilding period. Um, they tracked up with the quota for a bit, but then they've tailed off and, and, and didn't match as the quotas continued to increase in 13, 14, 15. Um, Dogfish prices have been pretty stable in recent years. This is inflation adjusted to $2022. This is fishery performance in the current fishing year. Um, it's a May 1 year, so we're about halfway, just a little more than halfway through. We're about halfway through. Um, and so up through the first few months, May, June, um, July, we're roughly tracking, but then have been kind of underperforming uh, the previous fishing year in the last few months. Uh, just uh, a quick overview of where landings have been coming in in recent years. Um, it's really Massachusetts, Virginia, um, and New Jersey are where most of the landings are coming in. Um, and just a sense of how it kind of proceeds to the fishing year. Um, you know, it it's, it's varies a bit year to year, but um, you know, I, I couldn't divide it up by month because you kind of, start cross-referencing some of the months and locations and run into some data confidentiality times, but um, just kind of you can get a sense of how landings can be spread throughout um, the year in that table three. Uh, it's just vessel participation based on some kind of annual landings bins that we created a number of years ago with the advisory panel. Um, you can see as those quotas started coming up in um, the mid 2000s vessel participation increased and then it's really been trailing off since 2012. So we asked the advisory panel for input on, um, on you know, what's impacting landings, their, their perspective on the fishery. Um, you know, they've continued to flag that there's a lot of factors that affect participation in the spiny dogfish fishery, including variable availability year to year, and, and you know, it's, a, it's a relatively low value fishery. So if fishermen have other opportunities, um, they, they may switch off of spiny dogfish. They definitely report, they do not see um, kind of a lot of overall abundance trends. They see a lot of variability year to year, area to area. And um, you know, each year they're very clear that, that, that from their perspective, the survey doesn't see the match the biomass that they see on the water. Um, and kind of given um, what's happened in the fishery and prices and then the lowering of the quotas, they you know, kind of excerpted this quote that you know, they really see we're at a point where interests in, in fishermen are going to evaporate from this fishery. Um, and, and they communicated that um, they think the, the, the quotas that we're at right now are artificially low. Um, and that is kind of driving down interest in the fishery and has now broken the supply chain from the south, from Virginia. The main uh, packer in Virginia has um, exited the fishery. A few other points. Um, again, they really see that management is kind of led to a roller coaster style management situation um, and just can't, is, is, is not supporting the fishery. Um, Bigelow, they flag um, both, you know, now it's it's not, the new assessment isn't as dependent on just the Bigelow spring survey like we were before we had an actual population dynamics model, um, but the Bigelow performance in that spring fishery, which is kind of um, the, the most important survey has been, um, variable, the Bigelow's performance, both in terms of whether or not it makes it out and um, delays and missed stations. And we also touched uh, on the, the dogfish research priorities and the, and the fishery performance report has more details on that. 
So in a couple of slides, I'm going to kick it over to Paul, but a quick background on our acceptable biological catch. Um, you know, essentially, the SSC is trying to take the assessment and the council's risk policy, consider how uncertain that assessment is, and then calculate an ABC, the upper limit on catches. So we have a new assessment that's passed peer review um, for a stock at where spiny dogfish is thought to be right now. The council's risk policy targets a 54% chance of not overfishing. Um, so a little bit better than 50-50 of not overfishing. Um, and the SSC, uh, as Paul will discuss in more TDL, kind of found this assessment to be kind of in, in, in middle of the road as far as uncertainty goes. And so the SSC calculates how far back off the overfishing threshold do we need to be in order to achieve that 54% chance. And for spiny dogfish at its current biomass relative to its target, about an eight or 9% back off from the overfishing level, about 663 metric tons. And then we get the ABCs that we do. Again, that back off is to achieve not a 50-50 chance, but a 54% chance of not overfishing. And I'll turn it to Paul for some more details on the SSC's findings. Okay, um, thank you, Jason. Um, this uh, the spiny dogfish assessment is the derivative or product of both the research track and the management track assessments. And, and there are a number of changes in those. Uh, as Jason has noted, one of the most consequential one was transforming it from a index-based assessment to a analytical stock assessment. Uh, that assessment is done in the programming uh, model called the Stock Synthesis 3. And one of the features of that model is that it uh, needs uh, to go back as far as possible to sort of get an estimate of the stock in its unfished condition. So in this case, uh, the data were taken back to, to 1924 in terms of both landings and estimated discards. Uh, however, the most consequential aspect of this assessment um, was the, the slower growth rates and earlier maturation or maturation at a smaller size. Um, so uh, that implies uh, you know, a smaller or, or, uh, average or maximum size for female spiny dogfish and, and overall lower productivity. So the consequences of, of uh, these changes are, are largely a reflection of those uh, those those particular changes uh, in growth. Um, there's also been uh, significant changes in selectivity over time, um, and some evidence of a greater fraction of the resource in Canada during the summer and fall. Now, that's not in, supported by all the analyses, but many of the sort of general empirical ones do suggest that um, the change in uh, MSY uh, definition uh, is that it, you know, it, it protects a larger fraction of the spawning potential up to 60%. And this is kind of a reflected through, con through consideration of the life history of dogfish and the, you know, the investment is made in the, um, in producing pups of a, you know, very large size. Um, but, you know, in the stock is not overfished and uh, overfishing is not occurring. So next slide, please. The um, uncertainty level that uh, uh, Jason mentioned, uh, let's see, could you advance the slide, please? I'm sorry, thank you. Um, is, is what is used to create that buffer between the overfishing level and overfishing limit and the uh, resulting ABC. There are a lot of details on how this is done. Uh, you can look at uh, tab 13, attachment five. There are nine separate factors that are considered um, and uh, they are used to uh, kind of compute or, or derive an appropriate level of overfishing. Um, we noted, of course, the, you know, the estimates of discards, you know, particularly historically and before 1990, um, are, are, are highly uncertain. Um, the stock did not have much of a retrospective pattern. Um, but there, there were no ecosystem factors uh, incorporated into the into the assessment. So, in terms of the recommendations, next slide. 
taking into account the, the dynamics of the stock, the expected uh, projected biomass, and the um, uh, council's risk policy. Uh, the OFLs, um, you know, gradually increased from 7,800 um, metric tons to 8,100 metric tons. Um, the, the stock is slightly above the, um, the, the stock is slightly above the uh, um, BMSY level. So those P stars are, are very close to, to 0.49, which is a limiting factor. And then the resulting ABCs uh, increase slightly over this time period from 7,100 to 7,500 uh, metric tons. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, in terms of uncertainty, uh, the environmental effects of, on, on availability are certainly ones that have been, you know, highlighted uh, numerous times. Uh, and, you know, that is why either the previous averaging method or the uh, modeling approach now sort of dampens some of those effects out. Um, the size and selectivity of the fishery are affected by markets. Uh, this has been clear for a long time. And it's an important factor in terms of harvesting um, uh, on on this resource. Fishing mortality on males is um, is very low. Uh, there's uncertainty in the in the discard survival rates. Uh, they differ by gear type. Uh, however, the empirical evidence for discard survival based on trawls is is really kind of a um, uh, expert judgment factor as opposed to uh, direct estimation. There's um, uh, use of a stock recruitment relationship in this assessment, um, which is you know de derived outside the model, uh, and it is was considered a, a source of uncertainty by the SSC. Um, the assessment still relies pretty heavily on the uh, uh, spring bottom trawl survey. Uh, it is the one that is um, appears to capture most of the resource. Uh, at, at the time of the survey, uh, not all of it, some may be offshore, but there is, for the most part, uh, a, a sense that it, it captures most of it. The fall survey uh, has a lot of fish in Canada during the time. Um, there, there, one of the technical details underlying this is the reliance on, on model weighting factors, and that is related to um, how the, the different uh, likelihood components are are weighted, uh, so uh, kind of a weedy type uh, uh, comment there. And then uh, uh, the other the other part is the use of the early landings uh, data uh, prior to 1961. So next slide, please. Research recommendations are generally kind of the mirror image of the uncertainty sources, uh, but in, in particular, um, improving the age and growth data remains a, a primary concern. Uh, there have been some projects uh, proposed with, you know, additional collaboration with Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada and uh, International Council for Exploration of the Sea. Uh, these, it is hoped that these will, you know, uh, facilitate better definition of, of, of dogfish um, uh, age and, and size composition. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the distribution of spiny dogfish outside the survey footprint, particularly in the spring, is an important consideration to try to get a handle on. Uh, the SSC recommended continuing participation in, in a number of tagging programs, particularly international ones. Um, port sampling is important, uh, especially with respect to monitoring the sex composition and size composition of the of the uh, uh, landed fish. Um, they, we recommended some additional exploration of model sensitivity to the starting conditions. As I mentioned, um, that uh, starting condition going back to 1924 uh, does have some um, uh, uh, some uncertainty associated with it. Then, but generally, uh, experience has been on the west coast in. Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, those types of, um, of uh, catch histories are very informative in terms of getting the model um, 
at, at the best starting point or the initial condition. Um, there are, of course, environmental effects on life history growth in particular. Almost every species uh, in the Mid-Atlantic and, and New England uh, area has declined in terms of growth rates uh, over the past 10 years and currently over the last 20 years. Um, and then there was some consideration or recommendations to um, try to get some better handle on uh, the diets of dogfish predators, that is, those things that eat dogfish, and to, to see to what extent there may be changes occurring in the natural mortality. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it back to you, Jason, and we can continue. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So once staff and the monitoring committee got those ABCs from the SSC, uh, the charge in the regs for the monitoring committee is to make recommendations to this joint spiny dogfish committee uh, to ensure that the annual catch limits ACLs are not exceeded. So the monitoring committee had an extended discussion of this kind of trade-off of maximizing the limited available quota versus avoiding ACL overages because there's pound for pound paybacks on any overages. Um, and well, I mean, you could potentially cause overfishing, but I think um, more immediately um, disrupt future fishing years because of those paybacks. So, I mean, without massive uncertainty buffers, when you when you look at the history of discard variability long term, you can't really ensure um, that you're not going to have an ACL overage. Um, and so the monitoring committee has taken kind of the approach as a, a, a good faith effort to avoid substantial overages in typical years. Um, you can't completely ensure there's no possibility of an ACL overage. Um, so Canadian and recreational landings are pretty simple. Um, and they're small amounts, but the discard and management uncertainty buffers are more complicated questions. Uh, these are dead discards, so total discards are higher, um, but they, as Paul said, they have a mortality um, estimate applied to them. So these are spiny dogfish dead discards um, in the last 10 years, just to give you a sense of the variability of those discards. Um, we looked at early 2023 discards, um, CAMs, um, does have kind of a neat feature of being able to, to, to do some rapid work once that data is loaded. Uh, so through June of the year, um, trawl discards were up a little bit, uh, gillnet discards down a little bit. Um, so nothing, you know, we wanted to take a quick check. Was there, is there anything in year? Um, nothing really looked um, like uh, kind of crazy different than typical. Also looked at early half year MRIP discards um, and maybe up a little bit in 2023 for the first half of the year compared to other years, but um, you know, when, but roughly the same when you consider the confidence intervals there. So, um, so after kind of digging into some of that background information, kind of two lines of thinking emerged on the monitoring committee. Uh, one, the industry members on the monitoring committee um, thought we should use the, the 2022 discard estimate without any management uncertainty buffer in there. Justification was that we've had an over, overall downward trend in discards. Um, 2022 estimates were close um, to what we set for 2023, that the state and regional allocations at the commission um, create an implicit buffer on landings. It's really hard to, if not impossible, to actually catch, to land all the landings because of how those allocations work. Um, We've got a slightly increase in ABC to potentially soak up any overages. Um, if they're small, it's not big changes in the ABC. Um, and then kind of flagging that there's this kind of immediate critical negative impact on the fishery from sequestering any quota versus what potentially could be caught. Um, and um, they thought that the options suggested by the rest of the monitoring committee were, were not reasonable. And these, are the recommendations from the rest of the monitoring committee. Um, primarily a concern that just using that low 2022 discard estimate without any management uncertainty buffer would be risky in terms of potentially getting into large paybacks that could disrupt future years. The assessment 
does suggest the biomass is going to increase. So you'd think that discards will probably increase. And most of the discards are not in the directed fishery. They're in other fisheries. So if biomass is going up, they're probably going to run into more dogfish. That small mesh trawl estimate was oddly low in 2022, flagging some concern about 2022. Um, and again, these discards are not primarily not occurring in, in the directed fisheries, but in other fisheries whose behavior may be variable. Um, and in, and then again, it's this trade-off between you either have a higher buffer and less quota now, but a lower chance of overage or vice versa. Um, the monitoring committee concluded that the relatively high three-year average set aside for discards probably captured enough of the variability um, that you wouldn't need a management uncertainty buffer in that case. Um, but then you have a very low quota even without any additional buffer. Um, and the monitoring committee, um, again, outside of the, the two industry members, thought that the assessment model, it generates expected discards. So that's kind of an objective way to, to determine some discard set-asides. Um, those are the numbers up there. Um, and still, that's not going to guarantee that there isn't an overage in the, in the committee. And again, I say committee here because the uh, Monitoring committee is charged with making recommendations to the committee, but committee slash council may still want to consider some additional management, management uncertainty buffers since by the nature of those model generated estimates, it's still, there's a 50 50 chance that um, they're uh, that realized discards are going to be higher or lower than projected. So, depending on the discard set aside, you're talking um, borders between eight and a half and 10.7 million pounds. Uh, there are tables uh, in, in the briefing materials, and then lower yet from those amounts if an, any management uncertainty buffer was utilized. Uh, we got some public comment during the uh, monitoring committee, just that um, kind of flagging similar thoughts as the AP fishery performance report. This is a lot of uncertainty um, from their perspective to um, decimate this industry from their perspective, um, advocating for not using any management uncertainty buffer um, just to kind of keep this fishery limping along. Um, and uh, they also flagged uh, kind of the landing sampling issue, noting from kind of their perspective on the docks, they don't see if what they would think would be enough dockside sampling. Um, and we did a little digging into this um, these are the samples that are used to calculate the length distribution of landings. You can see those tiny little blue bar, blue stacks in the in the far right. Those are the port side um, numbers of port side sampling events that uh, we had in 21 and 22. So quite low for this fishery. I think it reflects this larger concern the council has been discussing of the erosion of port side sampling across all our fisheries. Um, there's no um, market categories for spiny dogfish. So unlike a lot of our fisheries, um, we can use observer data for, they, they sample the kept fish on observed trips. So we have that for this, but um, you know, uh, the overall samples um, you know, are, are, are quite lower. The, the port side samples are very low. Um, and again, I think this is kind of symptomatic of um, troubles or likely to, to see if we continue to see erosion of um, support for the port side sampling program. Uh, okay, so uh, the committee took all that input from uh, the monitoring committee and um, had a, you know, similar lines of discussion as the monitoring committee. Um, and there was a motion from the committee to um, and again, the, the Canadian um, and rec stuff is pretty simple, but the committee did um, vote to recommend that the councils accept the model predicted uh, year specific discards for discard set asides. Um, and then that results in the quotas that are summarized here 10.15, um, 10.41, and 10.65 million pounds in. 24, 25, and 26, and that's table three of the monitoring committee summary. Um, there was um, a close vote on a substitute motion to use the lower amount of discards recommended by the um, industry 
um, participants in the monitoring committee, um, but that failed on an 8-8 vote. And then the um, committee not quite unanimously recommended this once the motion to amend failed. Um, so that's it for me. Um, and um, I'll, I'll know in the cover memo, staff uh, supports the committee recommendations, the model discards, um, and we can bring up that uh, committee motion when you're ready. Thank you. Any questions, comments for Jason? Shout of all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Jason, apologies if I have asked this before, but I mean, given the uncertainty around the discard estimates and sort of the model nature, I mean, you know, we get what goes into the assessment and the discards that come out of the assessment, but have we gone back to look at sort of, you know, the um, the the realized discards from, have we gone back to compare what, what our projected discards were versus like the realized discards, you know, we're given the level of uncertainty and how it's impacting the commercial quota these days. Yeah, this is the first time we're using this analytical assessment. So this is the first time we would be trying to utilize these modeled projected discards to, to set future specifications. And I guess maybe a follow up question. Um, I mean, I'm sure I know this has been brought up multiple times, but you know, just given the, the SSC comments on the reliance of on the bottom trawl survey, I mean, has there ever been any exploration? Maybe it's maybe it's a Dr. Hare question. Um, has there ever been any exploration of an alternative survey, an industry-based or cooperative survey to try to get at this question of, you know, the ability of the bottom trough survey to capture, um, you know, effectively capture where the biomass is distributed. We know that it, it's not necessarily capturing more of that offshore component. I mean, has there ever been anything through the cooperative research program or anything to try to address that? I don't think so in terms of, you know, testing out some kind of replacement survey. The assessment, the research track explored, but did not utilize um, essentially developing a, um, a CPUE that was from study fleet and observer data. Um, and it had a pretty close matching to the, um, to the bottom trawl survey. Um, last year, I did a similar thing just on observer data, looking at catch per observed trawl hour in just the trawl fishery, and it was pretty aligned remarkably closely with the trawl survey. Um, but I'll, I'll show one thing. Um, this is just a backup slide, but it has a proportion of large dogfish in a bunch of the data sets, um, including discards, landings, and the trawl survey. And there's very similar patterns that, um, you know, we had uh, a, a rapid um, kind of removal of large females in the directed fishery in the 90s, a bit of an increase when the fishery was more or less closed in the 2000s, and then a re-erosion since then. So, you know, they're not exactly the same, but we do see kind of remarkably similar trends in this size of large females um, across all pretty much all the, the, the major data sets. So um, I think that's one benefit of the analytical assessment is a model is trying to resolve, um, you know, what a number of different data, the story is being told by a number of dif different data streams. And this is kind of an important one, this larger female one, and, and it's kind of similar stories, but you may have seen Dr. Harris hand up too. John here. Yeah, thank you very much. I, you know, I think it is, you know, all of these data sources, you know, covering the same area are showing the same trends, as Jason pointed out, which is encouraging. I, mean, I think, you know, sort of to your question, 
uh, what is going on off the shelf with dogfish and other species, Elex, is an unknown. Uh, we do not have any fishery survey effort off the shelf. And so that would be an area uh, for further exploration. James Fletcher. I have a hope you can hear me. I have a great deal of respect for Jason and Paul Rago. But this dogfish situation in the science is totally, totally incorrect. Looking at the one on the bar, slide 47, the Russians were off there in the 70s with two to 300 foot vessels and two to 300 foot of them targeting dogfish. Now we come forward. Salkowski did a survey showing that the tags where the fish were. And to this day, we have not sent a vessel out there to find out the number of male dogfish. Coming forward to the council, the council should consider that the numbers that they have seen today are primarily, and I say primarily, for the female biomass. We have no clue if there's anybody in that council or anybody at the Science Center, and I challenge John Hare to send me somebody that will discuss what the possible number of male dogfish in the ocean are. But coming forward, I have heard the monitoring committee say that the industry does not want the smaller size fish. Monitoring committee does not realize that there are two lines of equipment that were built. If the dogfish were the same size, it would have worked. But we have no chance to use the equipment because we cannot get a male fishery out of the council or the National Marine Fisheries or the Science Center. It is total frustration. <coughs> excuse me, to see an industry that should be booming held back because of extremely, extremely poor science. Where are the satellite tags that should be showing up now? Oh, we dropped that program. Where was the man that helped bring this offshore movement? Oh, he moved somewhere else. Now, the question that comes up and should be asked is, are we using the male dogfish fishery as a unknown? Because we don't know. I haven't heard a discussion today of the amount of males out there. Sometimes it's said as much as 15 to 20 times more than the females. But the council, in its wisdom, refuses over and over again to address or even allow a male fishery. Now, to help this industry, why can't the council right now, today, put in a quota for male fishery at least double what the females are and give 10% of the landings can be females? Why can't the council help the industry? And you have to understand, I am extremely frustrated because dogfish is the key to the whole East Coast lack of commercial fishing. Thank you for your time, and I hope you understand how frustrated I am. I've listened to a number of things, and I, this one just drives me over the wall. But you should ask your SSC, Paul Rago, why the monitoring committee, and this puts him and the monitoring committee at odds with each other, why they did not discuss a male fishery. And the answer is, is, oh, we didn't have time? No, you did not want to, and I thank you for your time. But give us a male fishery with 30 to 50 million pounds, and we'll show you what's out there. Thank you.
Thank you, Jim. Glad you got through this time. Jason. Uh, yeah, the committee had a brief discussion on the, the male fishery um, kind of flag that as, um, as Fletcher noted, there wasn't time to evaluate um, kind of different sustainable catch options for a primary predominantly male fishery and that um, you know, a next step and that could be for the science center to conduct some analyses that would evaluate some higher male harvest because it's not going to be totally male harvest. So it would have to have some accommodation for the females that, that, that would come in with that. There was a, a master's um, work done, uh, degree work done uh, a number of years ago that included um, both staff from GARFO and the center that evaluated and, and found that there may well be some times and areas when predominantly males um, could could be caught and, and, and not encounter a lot of females. Um, but the kind of, I think the, the, the first step in that would be um, kind of getting some, you know, consideration of, of, of some kind of sustainable separate male side. And the model sees that it's not just females caught, right? It's integrating um, them to some degree. But I think it is probably the stock could withstand some amount of higher predominantly male catch, but we don't have a, a sense of what that amount might be yet. Seeing no more hands, Jason, can you bring the committee motion up, please? Sonny, would you like to read the motion into the minutes, please? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move, <clears throat> excuse me, I move that the council adopt 2024 to 2026 dogfish specifications that include the following deductions from the SSC specified ABCs. The most recent estimate of Canadian landings, 33, 36 MT2, no buffer for management uncertainty, zero MT, the model predicted year specific discards, 2,000 382 metric tons for 2024, 2,441 metric tons for 2025, and 2,494 metric tons for 2026. And the most recent three-year average recreational landings, 112 metric tons. This results in commercial quotas of 4,605 metric tons, 10.15 million pounds for 2024, 4,723 metric tons, 10.41 million pounds for 2025, and 4,831 metric tons, 10 million point 65 million pounds for 2026, reflected in table three of the monitoring committee summary. Thank you, Sonny. For this motion, we will not need a second, but let's have some discussion on a motion. Any discussion? John? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Attorney John Whiteside, representing Sustainable Fisheries Association. I participated in that Dogfish Monitoring Committee meeting back in November as one of the two ex officio members, and the two of us supported that um, an alternative, which was to what is on the board here, of uh, zero percent buffer and using uh, the discard number of 2,134 metric tons, which was from the 2022 management track. Um, there has been, as, as Jason had pointed out, a, a dramatic drop in discards over the last few years. And there's also what's happened is the dramatic cut that happened to the TAL last year resulted in buyers, our buyers in Europe, 
filling that void that they couldn't get from us uh, with European dogfish. At some point, and we are dangerously close to that, um, the TAL is not going to be enough to keep the last dogfish processor open. And if that, if that closes, there is no one who's going to buy dogfish. And we will, history will repeat itself back to 1917 when Massachusetts begged the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries to stop the scourge of dogfish from preying on all juvenile fish. Uh, the, I think Jason said it, but it certainly was in your materials that the, the last processor is more concerned about staying open through 2024 than any potential overage that could happen and a payback in 25. I think that the, um, that the TAL is, uh, landings are throttled by the ASMFC's state by state allocation in the South where we can't achieve uh, the TAL just due to that. Um, so I think that those are factors that come into it. And so I respectfully would request that you amend the committee motion and reduce the discard number to 2,134 metric tons for 2024, which would result in a TAL of 10.7 million pounds versus the 9.6. It, it really is, for the last processor, the difference between can we stay open? And thank you. James Fletcher. Is there any chance the council would amend that motion after 2024, 2026 and put female dogfish specifications, specify that this motion is a female and thereby leave the industry an opening to pursue a male fishery, they have got to have some relief up there. My North Carolina people in Virginia are out of this. Y'all have put us out of it, but leave it so at least the processors can stay open. It. And from my way of thinking, putting female dogfish, which the plan says it's for females, but specifying it here, it would leave an opening that may allow a male fishery to at least try. Thank you for your time. How does the council want to proceed? At this time, I look, John. Uh, two things. There's someone who's on the phone. Um, and is, was wanted to comment, and I got a text message, Pierre Juilliard. But second of all, my calculations, and when I have the breakdown of what is up on the board there, the using the, for 2024, of uh, the 2,382, I take that back. You're correct. I'm sorry on that. I apologize. No, um, wrong, wrong thing I was looking at. But Pierre Juilliard is on the phone on the line and wanted to comment. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, John, were you, so John, before you leave, were you correcting your previous statement about the fact that this motion does not allow for enough harvest to keep the industry in sur surviving through 2024 or are you going back on that or are you just you didn't have anything else to add just want to be clear i'm not going back on that i was looking at something different than what was on the board and so i was so i just withdrew the statement i just made in the last minute and a half uh, with the exception of pierre 
Pierre, I understand you're on the phone. And while we're waiting for that, um, so uh, an extraneous two um, crept into that motion after metric tons. It looks like I think it's just a, a typo. So um, um, I have it highlighted up there. It's just after metric tons, and um, I will delete that unless there's any opposition to that. Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's been a few weeks since we met as a committee um, and discussed this. And I just want to make sure after the testimony we just heard, the last thing I really want to, the last thing that I'd like to be a part of is putting the, putting the processing facilities out of business over a million pounds. I, I, so I'm concerned that if we can, if we move forward, as Mr. Whiteside testified uh, a few minutes ago, with this motion before us, that we may be taking a risk that that would happen. But I know that there was a discussion at the committee where we it was, and it was a pretty close vote, if I remember correctly, about the differ, you know, differing between two different. Motions and maybe Jason, maybe you can help remind me um, where that discussion went. I know that ultimately this is what passed the committee, but what would we, in order to do as as John suggested, is that within the range of um, is that within the range that we have the control over at this point? To be able to allow for some additional landings to keep the processing facilities open. So I, I think what what John was requesting is that instead of taking the amounts in this motion aside for discards, um, that the council take two thousand one hundred thirty four metric tons and set aside for discards, which was the discard estimate for twenty twenty two. Um, and I think I, I described the monitoring committee's concerns with that, um, that, um, while yes, the trend has been down, the assessment predicts that at these catch levels, biomass will start to increase. You would think that will increase discard some, um, small mesh bottom trawl discards were also particularly low in 2022, um, which raises concern if. You know, if that's likely to persist. Um, and the monitoring committee, you know, looks at the variability in discards and, um, you know, we have this model that is was an objective way to predict discards that also follows the expected trend in biomass. Um, so that's what the monitoring committee. Um, recommend that's what the rest of the monitoring committee recommended the difference you know in terms of the quota um comes out in 2024 i'll just kind of stick with 2024 um you know it's 10.7 or you know, 10.70 versus um the 10.15 that's in this motion um so that's and I mean, and you know, I kind of went through that slide that had the um, the justifications that um, that that John and, and Scott provided for that. So that's kind of where I, I think a big part of it is that the monitoring committee is charged with trying to ensure that the ACL is not exceeded, and that's um, for myself and the other monitoring committee members. That kind of leads us, you know, to to to. Again, a good faith effort in a, in a, in a typical year, we're not going to have a large overage. And that's why we, um, the rest of us kind of arrived at the modeled uh, discards. You know, could that be, um, 
you know, would that, you know, would the justification that was provided meet some threshold for NIMS or the smaller discard set aside? Uh, you know, I'm not sure. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jason. And now that you, and you may have mentioned this earlier, and I wasn't tracking it as well, but thanks for the uh, the reminder on that discussion. And uh, I feel more secure in, in where I stand on this issue now, given what uh, you and the monitoring committee had uh, presented. So thank you. Michelle DeVoe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jason answered my question, which was just clarifying, you know, what the difference is between what the difference would be in the commercial quota using you know the discard estimate up here versus what is in table one that dr whiteside and others propose so it's about half a million pounds so thank you dan you had your hand up put it back down And we're discussing around the table. John. If Pierre is sending me a text saying you have to unmute his phone, I, I don't, I don't know. I think he's unmuted according to Steve. Uh, try star six and then see if you can talk. Pierre. He's unmuted on this end according does to that, Steve. Does that work here? You got me now? Yep, we can hear you now. All right, perfect. All right, there we go. Sorry, my uh, audio for some reason on the webinar is not working, so I had to call in and watch the screen. But anyhow, uh, John pretty much touched on everything I wanted to say. Uh, again, for us on the discards, if you know, at, at that point, it's not going to matter if we go over or not because the industry will be over with at that point. So uh, we're more eager to try and get everything we can to try and stay open for the 2024, you know, roll into 2025 season. Um, it doesn't look likely, to be completely frank. Um, already the European market is following closely what we're doing here, so they've kind of unleashed their boats um, and they're fishing for dogs in Europe now. So I've already lost uh, a bit of the market share and it's going much quicker than I thought. Um, so we're going to have a huge issue here uh not only can I, I can't fill the orders with the quota that you gave us um if we don't get that little bit extra we're out of the running for processing to make the the, the you know the profit make the wheels turn keep the lights on um that's you know problem number one and then problem number two is with this limited quota uh the european market is already finding their own solution which is going to put quite a bit of boats out of business on the east coast and again, um, I've, I've expressed this in, in the past. Once once you get knocked off the uh, the buying chart, it's very very difficult to come back. So in 2026, 27, 28, if you have an abundance of quota to be caught, uh, they're going to say no thanks. We've already figured out a solution. Whether they have their own fleet fishing or they've replaced us with you know um, Pollock or cod or something else. Um, you know, my dad was probably one of the first people to export dogfish in the 1980s. And uh, it, right now, 90% chance I'm going to be the last one to export it in the next year or two. And uh, I just don't think the math is, the science is correct. Um, everything that we've said, you know, or I've heard in the past year doesn't line up to what we're seeing being landed uh, on the on the, on the shores and in our in our facility. So uh, I hope you take that into consideration and uh, I appreciate you giving me the time to speak. Dan Farnham. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I'd like to make a motion to substitute the lower 2022 discard estimate of uh, 2,134 metric tons. Yeah, motion to amend that'll be
Jason, can you scroll up to the original motion too? I think we got to do a little bit of calculating here to make sure we get it right. But can we put in there to remove the discards uh, from 2382 down to 2134? It may make it simpler. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Adam. Is the in, if the intent of the motion is to use this discard estimate of 2134 for all three years, you're not replacing only a single year estimate. If the intent of the motion is to replace the discard estimate for only 2024, but then keep the higher years, then it would make sense to keep that in as you're asking to do now. But my point is, I believe the committee discussion was to use the 2134 number for all three years, 2024, 2025, and 2026. So we would need to know, are we replacing just the 2024 discard number here, or are we replacing this discard number for all three years? Dan? My intent was to duplicate the, the uh, committee motion. Jason? So something to consider that could resolve this issue is, um, and it kind of, I don't know if this would match your intent or not, but you could start with that in 24 and then follow the same amount increases as was in the committee motion. Um, that is still starting lower, but at least kind of tracks a similar trend of following the assessment of an increasing trend. Then it would be clear what would be what would be deducted each year. It would kind of follow that slight uptrend. Just something to consider. Chris, Jason, the the struggle is with the the uh, the way that this sentence reads. So if we can, you craft something that duplicates exactly what Dan is trying with this motion, attempting to do with this motion. That's what, that's the struggle at this point. And then we can consider, I think, what you're proposing as an alternative. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. While you're, while you're figuring this out, um, I mean, I, I would support the 2134 for the three years because, you know, we had this conversation last year um, and Mr. Juilliard pointed out that his plan needs 12 million pounds a year to make this work. I mean, plant plant time is a really valuable commodity. You know, I mean, sea trades and they've got a lot going on and they're dedicating a tremendous amount of time and space to the dogfish industry which is MSC certified, by the way. So there is a lot at risk for a sea trade. You know, MSC is not a cheap date it, and it, it's hard to keep. So, you, you know, the onus is on them because discards are part of MSC certification. And, you know, we heard last year that, uh, you know, 12 million pounds is, is what it takes to run that plant. And I, I can understand that. Um, you know, right now, at, at, even at the, the change, we're still, I don't know, 600 tons short or something like that, what that plant needs. 
So I would fully support changing it to 2134. I just, I can't, I can't stress enough that they are the last ones, you know, and if, if they go away, then, then it's over. That's never coming back. Never. Because the dogfish business is a really, um, it's a messy processing business. There's a lot to it. It's hard to get people that want to cut dogfish by hand and you got to deal with all the byproducts. I mean, it's not, it's not the easiest business in the world. It's highly competitive. The margins are extremely small. I mean, dogfish aren't worth $3 a pound. They might be worth 30 cents a pound delivered all the way to New Bedford. So anything that this council can do to squeeze every pound out of this action is really appreciated. And I don't think 2025 and 2026 even matter because it may not make it that long. I mean, we're already hearing about you know, the seafood business is an international business and there's competition from places you never even heard of. And I would hate to see a, a U.S. processor lose market share any more than they already have over a handful of tons. So I, 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 I firmly support the lower number for three years. Thank you. Dan, are you good with how this is written now? Yes, I'm fine with that. Johnny Gwynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yeah, and I agree with Eric Reed on that, but I'd like to speak to the small boat fishery that this supports. This supports a small boat fishery up and down the coast that pay their insurance, pays their dockage, pays their, their, uh, their, their maintenance on these vessels. It's a wintertime fishery, and without this fishery, they may not be able to go into their summertime fishery. This is the small boat fishery that during COVID, we're still able to go out and bring fish in. So it's a very important fishery up and down the coast. I just want to make that point and I will second the motion if I can. Thank you. All right, we have a second on the motion by Sonny Gwynn. Mike Penny. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. While certainly being sympathetic in understanding the issues associated with the, all, the quota that results and the challenges that's going to pose to the processor, to the small boats, everybody else participating in the fishery, I feel like we've got to find another another way to get there. That simply picking a, a discard estimate that we like because it gets us the answer we want is not scientifically valid. It's not justified. So we've got to. There's got to be a rational basis why we think the 2022 discard estimate is more likely to be what the 2024, 2025, 2026 discards will be than the model-based approach that, the, that is being recommended and put forward by through the monitoring committee process. So I, I haven't heard a reason why the, the model-based discard estimates are wrong or inflated and why we think that we have a higher confidence in a lower discard estimate. The only rationale I've heard or been able to tease out is it gets us the answer we want. Um, and the, you know, the other side of that is the starting point for all of this is, is a biomass estimate that comes out of the assessment. The assessment uses discard estimates to determine what the biomass was. And if we used a lower discard estimate in the assessment, we might be, have a lower starting point of biomass, getting us ultimately to the same point. So we can't use a high discard estimate to get us a higher biomass and assessment result, and then a low discard estimate to get us a quota we want. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm asking the council to, to give this some thought and, and either come up with a, a strong rationale for the 2022 discard estimate being more realistic for the future years, or come up with a different approach to ensure that the industry has the quota it needs to continue to operate. And we're gonna to have to have this, you know, we'll be debating this again in, in January at the New England Council. Um, so there might be some time to give this some thought, but um, that's, yeah, that's just my comment on this motion. Thanks. Chris Bad Savage. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't support 
uh, this this motion at the committee level, but um, I mean, I, I definitely understand the the industry's concerns on this. Uh, and as Eric Reed pointed out, that there's really no other fishery that we manage like the spiny dogfish fishery as far as it's uh, you know, the marketing and um, uh, processing and, and exporting and, and things like that. So it's uh, um, you know it's they don't have a lot of flexibility as maybe some of the other fisheries that that we do manage. Um, there was a suggestion for using the 2134 metric tons next year uh, and then scaling that up, maybe using the kind of a hybrid where we use the, the model based estimates for 25 and 26. I don't know if that maybe gets us to a point that you know, is more in line with what, what Mike Pentney was talking about and using the justification of that we, we know that, uh, that, that quotas are at a state specific level and region specific level through the ASMFC plan. And uh, there's, it, it's highly unlikely that every pound of quota will be utilized just based on the, the, the state allocation. So that, that extra, um, the, the, the extra amount of quota uh, in 2024 would offset some of that, that unused quota that's just tied up in the state allocations. Uh, but then, you know, recognizing that as the biomass increases, uh, uh, predicted discards would also increase. Uh, I, mean, I mean, again, I'm not going to make a, a substitute motion to an amended motion, but uh, that, that if, if, if this motion doesn't pass, um, if that was, if what I suggested is an option, um, I could probably support uh, that over the, the committee uh, motion that We've heard plenty of concerns about. Thanks. Michael Easy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm on the same page with you, Chris. Uh, I feel like I'm sitting outside of the principal's office and trying to come up with some way to justify my actions, uh, but also not get in trouble when I get home, you know, so we can kind of just deal with it here. And I, I would hope that if we move forward, and, I, and I'd be prepared to work with you, Chris, uh, on crafting a motion um, in, in light of what Jason had mentioned as far as a hybrid approach. And I think that if I had to justify why we could use the 2022 estimate for 2024 and then use the model-based estimates for 25 and 26, um, I, could, I would say that it's the most recent years data that we have and, you know, using the model based, in, you know, perhaps into the future would be some way to address what Mike had brought up about coming up with a solution that's better than what's on in front of us right now. And I, there are, I, I don't see a lot of wiggle room in how to deal with that, but if the first motion wasn't wasn't going to make it for the industry, and the second motion isn't going to pass through as a recommendation from the council through the service, then there's only so many different ways we can skin the cat in between. So uh, I'd be, if this were to either be withdrawn or fail, I'd be willing to put forth a motion to amend to do as what you and I both um, are suggesting. Thanks. Eric Reed. Yeah, well, I guess I'm trying to get warmed up for this discussion in New England in a month and a half, I suppose. But I mean, the way I see it is, I think 2134 came out of the management track. That's the first thing. Um, but you know, the majority of the discards are in, are not in the directed dogfish fishery. They're in other fisheries, right? So if in fact there are less dogfish, the interaction from other fisheries other than the directed dogfish fishery will be down. And quite frankly, any, anybody that's in a trawl fishery, they want to stay as far away from dogfish as they possibly can. So I, I think between industry avoidance and the apparent lack of dogfish in the ocean, I could easily justify the 2134 because the, the non-discard fishery is going to have less interaction with dogfish in general. So I'll start there as a warm up. And, see what happens in Portsmouth, New Hampshire in February, but that's where I'm at. John Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a 
question from Mike Penney. Are there any provisions in MSA for this type of an emergency? I mean, this would seem like there should be some type of provision that would prevent, uh, if this plant goes and closes, it's really gonna lead to an economic disaster. And that's obviously much more of a concern at this point than possibly overfishing a little bit on the spiny dogfish. So just curious if there are any provisions there within the law. Like, I mean, yeah, you, you hit, you kind of hit it. I think the council could request emergency action, the agency to, to do something else, but this is the council doing its, you know, job under specifications. Um, I, I'm just concerned that it's, again, we're trying to, we're trying to find the answer we want and, and, and using the discard estimate as the tool to do that, as opposed to looking at other approaches. For example, and I'm not suggesting any significant changes, but for example, council's SSC is 100% CV around the OFL, which created a one and a half million pound buffer between the OFL and the ABC. If it used a 60% CV, we probably wouldn't be having this conversation around what the discard estimate should be. So there are other ways that we could have gotten to the result that um, the industry is looking for. I'm just very concerned about sort of back ending it through uh, a discard estimate that we don't have a strong rationale as to why that's the discard estimate we ought to be using. Eric tried to speak to that a little bit in terms of what we would expect from the non dogfish fisheries moving forward. Um, but I hadn't heard that as part of the rationale for the motion, and I hadn't really heard that, you know, previously part of the discussion um, today. So that's what I'm trying to, those are the sort of issues I'm trying to cover here. Eric, your hands still up. Or yeah, up. I'll be really brief, Mr. Chair. What happens if we looked at the 10-year discard average instead of just three? That's my question. I think the 10 year average is going to be higher, but the 10 year trend has certainly been down. Stephen, can you go back to the presentation? So this is the dogfish estimate dead discards from the assessment for the last 10 years. And so the John's 2134 is that terminal 2022 estimate right there on the far right. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, one might be able to make an argument saying we see this long term downtrend in discards, um, you know, and, and, and until you see a change in that trend using the terminal year estimate may be reasonable. Um, now, I do think kind of then letting that float up in the same pattern, and it was like plus 59 metric tons the first year, plus another 53 metric tons the next year, um, you know, might be reasonable in terms of you'd expect eventually that as a dog, if the dogfish stock is floating up a bit. Um, that uh, that to respond as well. So, um, I mean, kind of considering that trend information could be part of a justification potentially. Um, hadn't again, I'm just kind of thinking out loud to some degree, but it's certainly a 10 year downward trend um, that could be used to stick with the, the terminal year estimate. Uh, and theoretically last year, last go around, we use this trend to predict the discards would even be less the next few years, right? That's the council, uh, that's, that's, we did that last year, the year before, and that was approved. So, um, I mean, if that was okay, the tricky thing is now we have these model outputs, right? But they're, you know, I mean, um, that they, we, we haven't seen how they work out yet. This is the first time we would have been using them. So we've got, um, before, I think we didn't have something else to use. Um, now we do, but you know, there's a lot of uncertainty with that too. 
Um, anyway, I'll stop thinking out loud. Stephen, can you get the motion put back up, please? Adam. My first question is that the monitoring committee summary document referenced an ad hoc approach used for discards last year. I don't, I guess I'm too busy worrying about Christmas shopping or chocolate peanut clusters from the terminal to specifically recall what that was. Can you refresh us on what that ad hoc approach was that's referenced to see if we might be able to apply something similar here and whether you can or can't now, whether it fits the bill, what options do we have about delaying this action today to give ourselves a little more time to do exactly what the regional administrator is suggesting pursue an appropriate way of justifying what I think everyone that I've heard speak so far says is the right way forward here today. The ad hoc approach last year was um, essentially observing that um, if the survey has been trending down, so should discards and just kind of following that um, kind of following that projection downward. Um, I don't think it really, uh, that specific thing applies exactly in this case, um, especially since we have the biomass is now projected to increase. Um, but again, I, I think, you know, one could point to that trend, the, the, you know, the 10 year trend being down as a, you know, potential rationale for at least keeping the start at that most recent estimate. Um, again, I don't know if that would pass muster or not, but that's what I'm. Um, that's 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 what I am coming up with currently as one way to rationale. One, one way one way to justify saying that you know it would be reasonable to start at that 2020 lower 2022 estimate, but um, but staff would also support then starting to follow that increased trend after that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As one of the states that's very directly involved in this fishery, I have a lot of empathy toward the industry. We actually are trying to find financial assistance in our sector now in our state toward the industry to help them out, keep it going um, on the infrastructure side because we've had some infrastructure issues this year. Luckily, one of our uh, industry members stepped up to the plate to make sure it kept going. Um, I echo a lot of the same thoughts that Chris and Mike had. I'm wondering with the um, maker of, the, of this amended motion, if we just made the argument for that for 2024 now, and we have the time to come back to this and keep working on it for 25 and 26, would that be an option? And if Mike Petney could weigh in on that, I'd appreciate it. just for 24, and then we come back and work on 25 and 26, we have more time. Yeah, you could do that. It doesn't really help us with the issue of what's, what discard estimate are you presuming for 2024? Because that's what we're, that's the real crux of the matter, it seems, is what happens in 2024. Quotas start to go back up in 2025, 26, so maybe the industry, you know, if it can, I think as I understand it, if the industry can make it past 2024, Given the quotas, there's less concern for 2025. I don't, I don't want to presume that and not be completely correct, but 2024 seems to be the problem. Well, 
So, Mr. Chair, I just it sounds like this may be a plausible compromise just to get us moving. Um, I'll just offer that up to the maker. Just maybe we can get something going here. You know, number one, we haven't been asked to do a rationale. I'd like to give a little rationale for the for the motion. Um, I'm going to reference in three input historical trends, socioeconomic impact, and also the downward trend over the last ten years in the in, in discards. On a committee level, this is an eight to eight vote, and it failed. From what I'm hearing right now around the table, if this motion fails, there's people ready to come up with a, another motion that might be more palatable to the council and the service as a whole. I, um, I think we're, I would, just, I, I'd rather put it out to a vote at this point. Sonny, mm -hmm. would you, are you good with that? Okay, thank you. All right. Dan, will you go ahead and read the, we're gonna go ahead and take a vote on this. Dan, will you read it into the minutes, please? Yes, Mr. Chair. I move to amend to deduct the 2022 discard estimate of uh, 2,134 metric tons for the 2024 to 2026 specifications instead of the 2,382 metric tons for 2024. 2,441 metric tons for 2025, 2,494 metric tons for 2026. All those in favor, please raise your hand on the computer. I have 11 in favor. Please put your hands down. All those opposed, please raise your hand on the computer. I miscounted again. Yeah, one. Got six now. Three, four, five, six. Six. Yeah. I have six in the opposition. Any extensions? All right. Two abstentions. Three. Two abstentions. All right. The motion passes 11 6 to 2. Put your hands down. Well, now we got to. Yeah, give me about 60 seconds. Peter Hughes. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I supported that motion, but here's my concern and my fear is that the regional administrator is going to reject it. Um, he's basically said that, that we don't have the rationale to support the motion. I've been down this road before with Elex Squid, and it's not a fun road to travel down. Um, I, I don't know what the um, Default measures are moving forward into 2024. Um, the default measures could 
restrict this fishery in such a way um, that by the time that the regional administrator makes a decision on whether he's going to vote in favor of whether the agency is going to find this favorable or not, um, could put the fishery in a, in, a, in a very peculiar position. I'm not on the committee, so I'm, I'm not familiar with the default measures are. Um, and, I, and I will vote for this again um, as the main motion, but we're putting ourselves in a, in a horrible position and um, it's uncomfortable. And it's going to be uncomfortable for the entire fishery if the default if the default measures are much more restrictive than the original motion was. So we need to think about that. Okay, so I think I've um, kind of transposed in from the table one, um, and that would be then 10.70 and 11.09 and 11.44 million pounds. We can add in the metric tons later. Um, but I think for purposes of discussions, a million pounds are probably most useful currently. So that's what, um, once amended, that's what you end up with. Do we have any discussion on the motion, Dan Farnham? Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two, two questions. One is to Mike. Mike, after hearing the rationale of the, of the declining discards over the last 10 years. Does that make have any impact on, on what you said earlier? Are, you, are we still in uh, not in a good place? Mike? I mean, yeah, I mean, you can look at that trend and you can draw a line that, you know, that's got a negative slope and, but I think we haven't seen a number from Jason or or the monetary committee or anybody that suggests what do we expect the 2024 discards to be? If it follows that trend, what would they be? I don't know. If we use, you know, we typically use a three-year moving average, which which tends to reflect trends. I still think that three-year moving average would be higher because 2022 is the lowest of the in that time series. It's we just need some basis for using. 2022 discard estimate moving forward. Um, and so I guess, you know, given that this motion is likely to pass, maybe between now and the New England Council meeting when this will, issue will come up, um, maybe there's some additional analysis that could be done to demonstrate the, you know, the, the, the confidence that we should have more confidence in that 2022 estimate than, than we do right now. Or, or more of a solid basis for that discard estimate being uh, an improvement upon the model-based approach or the, the ad hoc approach that was used in previous years. Absent something like reconsidering the, the SSC CV, um, everything kind of hinges on what the disc, what discard estimate we use. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. That brings me to my second question. So. If this motion passes here today, and in a month and a half, it comes up again for New England, and they have more time to think about this, and, and they come up with a different, either a better rationale after doing research, or they come up with a different motion, a different uh, uh, plan, then the process would be you could pick either one or something in the middle. What happens then? 
Yeah, the way the regs are written, if the two councils do not, I you know, select the same uh, option, same same uh, specs, then what comes to me, I get to I the agency gets to select anything not rejected by both councils. So yeah, it could be either or or something in the middle that wasn't rejected by both councils. And by reject, we mean like, you know, a motion comes up and it fails and then the motion comes up to the other council and that fails there as well. So there would be whatever, you know, we'd look at the options in the document and, and have some flexibility for good or bad. Mike Oisi. Looking across the room here, I'm trying to figure out what the what the right thing to do is here. Um, Dan, I was going to take you out for a, a state dinner if you could get Mike to agree on the record at a meeting if how he's going to support or not support something. <clears throat> but I think he, I think the the regional office has provided us some pretty solid advice moving forward with coming up with a rationale for what it is we choose ultimately uh, to put forth um, to the New England Council for them to discuss. And I think I'd feel I'd feel better about all of it, uh, given the discussion that we've had today. If we were to, or I'm going to at least make the attempt to try to find a middle ground between all science based model approach for the 2002 estimate approach for the discards and I'm going to blend it. And I know Jason is going to have to do a little, another little, some tweaking on some numbers, but I think they're all there now. Um, what I'd like to do is make a motion to amend. To use the 2022 discard estimate. 2,134 metric tons for 2,024 only. And then the language would then, if we went back, well, the original motion has been modified. So we'd have to go back to pull the language from the original motion before it was modified to say, for 25 and 26, the model based, however, it was specified originally, it would include that in the language of the, so that would all be part of the amendment. So we're kind of just taking out a chunk and putting a new chunk in. Um, maybe somebody, Jason can help me with the language uh, for that, but I would like to make that motion, Mr. Chairman. And if I get a second, um, I think I've already provided rationale, but I can offer some more. <clears throat> Chris Bat Savage for the second. Does that motion reflect what you're trying to do there, Mike? It does. Yeah, without all the specifics, um, the intents there. So I think what if this were to pass, I think we could reflect the intent back into the original, or back into the motion that's the, the main motion right now to show all the numbers and everything, but that's the intent. Um, and that I don't have any additional rationale other than what I've already mentioned, Mr. Chairman, so I'll leave, maybe Chris will have something to add. Chris, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, just real quick, and much has already been said as far as uh, rationale for, for this. Uh, uh, one one extra thing is, I think in 2022, that discard estimate had a, um, uh, an unusually low discard estimate for small mesh uh, trawls, um, accounting for higher discards along with uh, you know with the stock increasing. Could also provide some some protection if we see small mesh trawl discards you know, go up higher than what we saw in 2022. John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm fine with this motion, but I was just curious since Mr. Pentany mentioned it twice, Jason, what would the uh, quota be if the CV was changed from 100% to 60%? Do you have that? Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm not sure. Branded, did we calculate six? No, I think in the discussions leading up with Brandon and I going into that SSC meeting, it seemed like given all the uncertainties that either 100% CV or a higher CV, 150% would be um, the two likely outcomes. Um, we did not calculate it for 60% and um, I would guess that'd be an unlikely outcome given all the uncertainties in the assessment. Right, I'm just curious since Mike did mention it, so it sounded like it would be more acceptable than the path we're going down. John here. Thank you. Um, Jason or Brandon, do you know what CV was used in the last by the SSC in the last specification setting? I mean, I don't, but I mean, we were doing some um, also some creative calculations in the last APC setting. So I, I don't think their CVs would be comparable. Paul Rago. Uh, yeah, I just to, to that point, uh, most of the uh, factors that were evaluated had CVs of either 100 or 150 percent. The option of going to 60 uh, percent was only possibly justified on the basis of uh, the retrospective pattern and with respect to um, uh, the assessment history in terms of exploitation rates. So um, I, I don't think the option of dropping the, the CV to 60% is really uh, a viable one. Thank you. And Farno. To the point of the, the declining discard rate in the small mesh fisheries, um, over time, just about every small mesh fisherman has figured out that using a large mesh you know, rope trawl or rule trawl, whatever you want to call it, has a big impact on the amount of discards, you know, than that of, of, of dogfish you catch, not just dogfish, flatfish. We've all learned over time that those nets pay for themselves rather quickly by by not um, interacting with certain species. And I, I think you're going to, I think personally, I know, I, you know it's not science, but I think personally you're going to see a lower rate of, of, a, of a, a, a discard rate in the small mesh fisheries. Adam. So first off, let me congratulate our vice chairman. After six, seven years as chairman, you've probably been chomping at the bit to make a motion for a long, long time is my guess. So congratulations. That being said, unfortunately, I can't support this motion. I think this is a huge step backwards for us with regards to trying to justify a discard path forward. We talked significantly about the downward decline in discards, and essentially this motion is saying we expect the discards to increase dramatically from 2024 to 2025. So if we're using as our justification for a lower discard number in 2024, as a number equal to that 2022 number due to declining discards as a trend, I don't see how we justify this. We're taking one number that we're using for 2024 and then saying, oh, and then we're gonna jump back to the model for the next two years. Uh, I think this sends a more difficult message, quite frankly, to the service to justify. While I appreciate the intent here, my expectation is that this dilutes our argument and makes it harder to put forward for the service for 2024. If they'd like to chime in and tell me I'm wrong, I'm all ears. Um, but until I hear otherwise, I'm going to have to oppose this motion on those grounds. Like Luisi, I think you had one comment. And then if you want to read, you want to go ahead and read the motion then into the minutes. Take a vote. 
Yeah, the motion, uh, I move to amend to use the 2022 discard estimate of 2,134 metric tons for 2024, and then use the model-based discard estimate for 2025 and 2026. John Clark, you want to put your hand down on the computer? Or no, I, Stephen just did it. All right, all in favor of the motion, please raise your hand on the computer. We have 15 in favor of the motion. Everyone put their hands down, please. All those opposed to the motion, raise your hand. I have four opposed, five opposed. And there will not be any other votes that makes 20 the motion passes 15 to 5. so now we have to add this into become the main motion Carson picked a great time to have a baby, didn't you, Jason? That'll be related to sturgeon. I'm the <laughs> dogfish has been mine. Um, I think that these are. Um, I think this would capture the amendment into an amendment amended motion. Nowalski. Earlier when we talked about some appetite for using the 2134 number for 2024 and then following a similar trend for model output, I was initially under the impression that the appetite there was to follow an upward trend proportional to the difference from the model output discards of 2382 and 2024 compared to the 2134 2022 discards. That's what I thought I had heard earlier. The motion that we have before us now says we're going to use the 2134 next year and then we're just going to jump right to the model output the following year. So I'm going to go back to what either I thought I heard doesn't really matter, but I'm going to make one additional attempt to substitute and I'm going to substitute to use discards of 
2134 metric tons in 2024, 2187 metric tons in 2025, and 2234 metric tons in 2026. This represents a proportional change in discards relative to the model output. What was your number for 2025? 2,234. Essentially, these are all 89.59% of the model output, which is a proportional number for 2024. Sorry, what was your number for 2026? I'm sorry, 2025 was 2187. Twenty two thirty four for twenty twenty six. And if there's a second for this, I'll just give a little more rationale along the lines of what I've already started with, but I'll wait for a second. We have a second on the amended motion. Peter Hughes. So, as I said, my concern about the last motion was that there was a jump in what we were doing from going backwards to a lower number based on the idea of declining discards. My feeling is that this is at least consistent with the sense of we are using the proportion of discards as recommended by the model in conjunction with following the long-term trend that we've seen, well, a trend over the last decade of declining discards. So that makes sense to use a lower discard number for these years because of that decline in combination with the way that the model is predicting an increase and expects an increase as biomass increases. So that makes me more comfortable, at least with this approach. We're using a lower starting number for discards, but do recognize that the model predicts an increasing trend in discards as abundance increases moving forward. Thank you, Adam. I think we've discussed quite a, this quite a bit already. Let's go ahead and go straight to the vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand on the computer. I have 18 in favor. Everyone put their hands down, please. All those opposed? Any abstentions? One. Motion passes 18, zero to one. Now we'll let Jason do his magic to go back up to the original motion to add this in.
Okay, so the way I've attempted to bring this in is specifying the 2022 estimated discharge for 2024, the 2134, and then follow the trend of the model based discard projections. I think that captures the intent there. Everything else the same. And then I just plug those into my Excel spreadsheet um, that I had been using to track to just calculate the other one. So the um, 10.7 that stays the same then the ABC is floating up a bit and the discards are floating up a bit. So then you go to 10.97 and 11.22. I think my math is right. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Let's see if we can do this easy. Is there any objection to the motion? One objection or do you want to abstain? Yes. Motion is going to pass with one objection. And Jason, is there anything else you need to bring before us? Peter Hughes? Just, it's not a committee motion. Because we've modified the original motion, right? Right. We just got to get rid of that on the bottom. Yes. All right, Jason, are you good with everything? I think we're good for dogfish. All right. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's take a 11 minute break. We'll be back at 315.
Hey, Stephen, could you pull up the mackerel two presentation, not the mackerel presentation when we start? Thank you. All right, welcome back everyone. Let's get started on our next agenda item. Jason's gonna give us the 2024-2025 Atlanta macro specifications. Jason, whenever you're ready. Thank you and for Stephen, I'm, can you click once on the screen, Stephen? This is not advancing here. There we go. Uh, for folks looking at the presentation that was posted, um, these are the same slides, but this presentation has been trimmed a little bit. Okay, um, so where are we right now? These are the 2023 specifications. Um, just um, again, for, for kind of what status quo is, um, however, um, and okay, so that's one thing I will continue to note um, in terms of a hist more historic background is that we have a history of being substantially off with our macro assessments and, and this kind of, um, kind of factoid is the one that always drives it home to me the most that in 90, 1997, we set our allowable biological catch about 10 times higher than what we now think the entire SSB was in that year. Um, so this is stock status um, trends in the assessment. Um, and so um, again, at, at a very low point currently, those bumps in the 80s and early 2000s are basically the, the results of single year classes um, working through the stock. So there's fishing mortality. Um, the catch was very low in 2022, and that's why hopefully um, in 2022, right at the end of the time series there, we've kind of finally gotten below the overfishing threshold. Uh, currently, while we have those 2023 specs um, that I displayed earlier, um, the council requested emergency action in August uh, to close the directed fishery and um, the service Implemented that, implemented that on October 12th um, and it going down to 20,000 pounds for limited access vessels and 5,000 pounds for open access vessels. Um, so that was like you know, two or three months from the initiation of, of, an, of an idea uh, to implementation. So I wanna thank the, the service for um, really pushing that through quickly. Um, landings and revenues over time. I mean, again, the revenues are basically following landings. Um, this is 2023 to date in blue. Um, so despite the emergency closure, you can kind of see where it kind of um, working up um, towards the total quota. Um, but I think this kind of flags that it was a good idea to um, do that emergency closure. You can see that big um, jump in landings in yellow there last year. Um, if we had something like that late in the, late in the year this year, we would have been over if not for the emergency closure. 
Um, AP Fishery Performance Report Overview, again, you saw this before. Um, I'll just flag that, um, you know, this, it's not a demand issue that has led to low landings in recent years, but they've been scarce in the southern areas. Um, folks have noted the impact of the inshore buffer area that's not in effect anymore in some previous years. Um, folks continue to flag that uh, if we'd had a river heron in Chad Court, it may have shut the fishery earlier in 2023 than it would um, have otherwise occurred. We had a few more trips come in that, that lowered the, the rate as the fishery proceeded. Um, just a few notes about Canada. Their stock assessment trends have been similar to the U.S., kind of a, reflecting a, a dismal appraisal of, of the resource. Um, and they closed their fishery pretty much totally in 2022 and 2023. Um, and you've seen correspondence previously that they've uh, requested that um, U.S. management take a, a, a similarly conservative response. Um, so again, you saw a lot of uh, you saw this a lot of this information in August. Um, I extracted a few slides that I thought we could skip in the sake of time, um, but I'll turn it over. Um, so the council at the last meeting requested the SSC can consider um, an averaged ABC approach in addition to the single year um, different different ABCs for 24 um, and 25. And Paul will give a summary of of their findings on that. Okay, thank you, Jason. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll I can bypass this slide. I, I think it's uh, a twisting and winding road, uh, and so that's tortuous and uh, torturous for those in the center, namely uh, Kirsten Curdy and, and certainly Jason in terms of how we got here. Um, the, the SSC considered four scenarios. Uh, the overarching consideration, of course, is to rebuild by 2032 with a 60% uh, chance of or greater of rebuilding. Uh, we looked at four scenarios with varying methods of adjustment for the uncertainty in the recent recruitment estimates. Those were identified as the most problematic ones for short-term projections. Um, the one that was selected um, is, is one that looks at the initial stock size in 2022 and sets that equal to the median of the time series. The terminal year recruitment estimates are always uh, pretty lousy. Uh, one of the reasons is, is that they're, um, they're not confirmed by any subsequent observations of catch uh, or discards. So uh, the only thing we have is, is, a, is an estimate based on uh, a survey uh, comparison. So they, they tend to be very variable. Um, so this was considered appropriate uh, by the SSC in view of the, the problems of overestimating rebuilding in recent years, as Jason has mentioned. Um, and also just would note that this approach of uh, setting the terminal year estimate equal to the median is one that's been used in a number of assessments throughout the Northeast and, and more, most relevant perhaps is that for tilefish um, in, in recent years in which that, those projections are conditioned on uh, a terminal year estimate being set to the average. Um, in terms of the recommendations, uh, we looked at the year specific ones, which was, you know, 26, 27, 26, going up to 3,900. Uh, if you take the average of those, and that average is one in, that meets the uh, risk criterion and still rebuilds, it drops down to 3,200 per year. So essentially, if you take out an extra 472 and 24, you're going to give up 700 in 2025. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, the SSC discussed and, and, and gave some uh, comments on the, the, the various uncertainties. Um, the retrospective pattern of overestimating stock biomass and recent recruitment is, is a problem. Um, if you overestimate the SSB, you're going to set the catches too high. If you overestimate the recruitment, the subsequent projections are going to be too optimistic. So they feed into each other, but uh, particularly this the topic of recruitment is one that uh, is, uh, is, is a big concern when you're talking about uh, a rebuilding strategy. Um, there was a fair amount of discussion within the SSC on the role of natural mortality versus fishing mortality. Uh, the uh, 
research track assessment did not find a lot of evidence of, of uh, trends in, in natural mortality. Uh, but of course, it, it doesn't mean they aren't there. It just means that they're very hard to detect. Um, and uh, mass balance type approaches that have been used have not been entirely successful. Um, the uh, recent updates in the Canadian bait and recreational harvest uh, were an important change in this in this update. And similarly, there's a there's a reliance, a fairly strong reliance on the DFL um, egg survey. Uh, the U.S. survey is is not as useful because it it doesn't occur during the uh, uh, peak spawning period. Uh, and so it, it's more of an intermittent uh, indicator of, of overall abundance. And then, and then finally, we heard a fair amount of, of discussion and, and valuable input from industry regarding uh, changing patterns of, of local abundance. Um, you know, some evidence of uh, extended uh, uh, spawning periods as a result of, of changes perhaps in water temperature. And then finally, um, the the composite effect of of these changes is that it uh, sort of alters uh, the efficacy of the bi biological surveys. So, um, if they're not distributing as previously observed, then you may have problems of estimation uh, in, say, egg surveys or <clears throat> uh, the bottom trawl survey. So, those are those were the the, the key factors and and considered by the SSC in terms of its uh, uh, recommendations for uh, either a year-specific um, ABC or a, uh, an averaged one. So thank you. Back to you, Jason. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we essentially have like kind of two options. Um, you have two options. Um, the monitoring committee said, you know, the other deductions for Canada, for recreational catch, commercial discards, that doesn't really change here. Um, this is version one um, with the year-to-year -year ABCs, um, and this is what you preliminarily approved um, last time. And then now we also have version two. All the deductions are the same, but we're starting with that averaged ABC. Numbers are the same for the ABCs, so the commercial quotas are the same um, as well, 868. So it's a bit higher in one year, a bit lower in, in, in the other year. So with this extra quota, I mean, it's still really incidental level, um, but can increase the trip limits a bit. Um, and um, the, so the monitoring committee looked at this. Um, I proposed uh, a, an option that I thought would about get there, and it, I think it got pretty close of using that uh, constant quota for the two years. That if you start at an initial trip limit of 20,000 for limited access and 5,000 for open access, um, which is where, where we're at right now with the emergency closure, and then at 80% half of those, um, you get pretty close to the quota. Is like 7% over, if you apply those trip limits to what happened in 21 or 2022, in 21, we would have been 7% over. In 2022, um, we would have been 25% under. Again, that's assuming a lot. Like it's assuming that the trips that were really big still occur, but now at 20,000 pounds. They may not have occurred at all. But you could have some new trips that since there's not a lot of mackerel out there, um, people take a few more small trips, right? We're, 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 we can't imagine what those might be. So this is kind of a rough cut of things. 2023, when we did those analysis, was running about in between mid-year um, trend-wise. So again, it seems like this would work pretty well with these quotas. Um, so. Um, before you today are, what do you want to do for specifications and trip limits for 24 and 25? You theoretically could keep the previous um, or use the averaged ABC that you requested the SSC um, to produce and the associated higher trip limits. Um, and staff does recommend in adopting those new options, um, that averaged constant ABC approach constant quota. Um, I mean, 
mostly because it, it, it would create some stability for 24 and 25. Um, and not that it's like really a great, uh, you know, a, a much better situation for the fishery, but, but at least it creates some stability. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Any questions for Jason? Seeing none, Jason, I think we have a motion that can put up on the board. I think Stephen should have the motions up momentarily. Peter Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would make the following motion. I move that the council adopt the 2024 2025 macro specifications with an ABC equal to 3,200 metric tons, Canadian catch equals 74 metric tons, US ABC equals ACL equals 3,826 metric tons, recreational set aside equals 2,143 metric tons. Commercial discard set aside equals 115 metric tons. DAH equals 868 metric tons equals DAP. JVP equals zero. TALF equals zero. To accompany these, to accompany these trip limits would be an initial trip limit of 20,000 pounds for limited access permits and 5,000 pounds for open access permits. Once 80% of the quota was landed, trip limits would change to 10,000 pounds for limited access permits and 2,500 pounds for open access permits. Jason, I think we got the discrepancy on the numbers. The ABC. Okay, I'm just opening up. So the ABC is 32. And what's Okay, yes. Um, oops. Let's double check that. 74, I think that's right. Okay, I think otherwise, just gonna double check the others here. Okay, I think otherwise looks okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Jason. Michelle Duvall. I was just gonna second the motion. Thank you. Anything else to bring up on this topic? Any discussion at all? Yeah, I will make one quick note that uh, so we don't have to read the whole thing into the minutes again. Uh, there was a change from the US ABC equals to the ACL equals originally it was 3826, but now it's 3126 metric tons. Seeing no hands raised, uh, let's hopefully see if we can get this done quite easy. Jeff Kalen. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
members of the council. I know we're a little behind, but what's going to happen on the recreational side of the equation? Are we going to be reducing the number of fish that are allowed to be uh, kept by that uh, sector? I mean, we've got the 3,200 metric ton ABC, 2,143 metric ton uh, estimate of recreational catch and another 115 tons of discards. That's 2,258 metric tons relative to a 3,200 metric ton commercial allocation. I mean, doesn't something have to give on the recreational side of the equation here? Uh, that's a open question. I don't know if the monitoring committee addressed that or not. I, I did not read the memo. I apologize. I spent way too much time on flu scup and black sea bass this week. Um, but where are we on that? I mean, why, why is this just going one way? Jason. The FMP generally has expected recreational catch is deducted. Um, that's been the approach, I think. I mean, theoretically, that could be modified, but we haven't seen really the initial effects of the trip limits that were put in for the last rebuilding action. Um, I think, you know, given the also most of those, most of that catch occurs in state waters that the council doesn't have direct control over. I think if the council wanted to initiate like a separate action to consider additional or different um, recreational, you know, bag limits or seasons, um, I think I would recommend that that be considered under a separate action, especially since most of that is in state waters and not directly um, kind of, um, the council doesn't have, a, a, can't really affect that immediately and directly. Yeah, so so we've only had those possession limits in place for a year or so, but so we don't know what that catch is. But at the same time, we're projecting thirty five hundred metric tons of wreck catches. So I, I don't to me that doesn't add up at all. Um, but I'll let it go. Um, well, I have the, I wanted to get it on the record, and while I have the microphone, um, if I can, Mr. Chairman, a few a few couple meetings ago, we talked about the potential. Uh, in pursuing a um, disaster declaration for the mackerel fishery. And uh, in, the, in October at the commission meeting, I talked to a lot of state directors about that issue. And um, uh, Dan McKernan had his staff together at that time, and he was responding to a constituent in a letter that I received. And basically, uh, what he what was said was that um, you're supposed to you have to have at least a 35 percent revenue loss uh, compared to the previous five years, and that uh, unfortunately recent landings have even though they've been on decline, um, prices were up, and that uh, revenue loss was only about 26 percent uh, in 2022 and 23 percent in 2023. And Dan goes on to say that we really need to get through uh, the 2024 fishery to determine whether or not there's a potential for a 35 percent reduction in revenue in 2024. So I just wanted to mention that today um, to put that on the radar screen for the council that it's still an alive issue. And in Dan's uh, letter um, of October 21st, he points out that the staff at Mass Division Marine Fisheries has been working with council staff. I know Jason has been great in talking with us about this and also NOAA staff. So it's still an alive issue, Mr. Chairman. And while there's some concern about the overfishing status, um, as we've talked about this in the last few weeks, that may not be a deal killer. Uh, remains to be seen. Um, so I just wanted to I'm not suggesting it be a priority for 2023. I don't think it looks for, excuse me, 2024, but just that it's an issue that the industry has uh, on, on its radar screen. And um, I don't know how much of Jason's time we might ask uh, for next year, but it's still an issue that's on the table, Mr. Chairman. So I just wanted to make that point today. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Pete Libro. Pete, it looks like you're muted on your end. How's that? Is that better? That's a lot better. Okay. Um, I'm a small boat mackerel fisherman out of Gloucester, and I operate under the open access permit. And I just wanted to say that I appreciate and I support uh, this motion. Um, it gives us enough to to kind of work with on a on a small scale basis. Thank you, Pete. Any more discussion? Bobby? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, kind of struggling with, with some of the figures here. I mean, I'm looking at the recreational set aside and, and, and looking at the commercial, uh, and there's a massive disparity there. Um, and if I understand it correctly, you arrived at the recreational based on that's previous performance. Yes. And there, but there is uh, I, last year, year, in the last year or two, there's been a new, new implementation of, sorry, I can't think of the name of it, but a new tool in place to, to track or monitor the recreational aspect. Yes, I mean, that um, 2143 is largely past performance. I think uh, I'll have to double um check i think that also that's carried forward from that um i think that's carried forward from that action building in some reduction related to that but i'm gonna have to check, double check that all right and the, the follow-up on that would be if the new we, if we do have something in place a new tool in place but that's not being that's currently not being utilized i guess we're waiting to evaluate um we'll be better off to set specs for one year instead of two and then reevaluate. This gives us. I mean, on the reevaluation, staff's recommendation is generally to set it for two years. The council and SSC does reevaluate it each year. The council could decide to modify it, but that's not the books um, in the case that it doesn't. Um, there's no reason the council can't modify it, even if it's set for two years and the service actually has to publish a rule each year when the council adopts multi year specs. Um, so I think there's, um, some. Substantial workload savings setting it for two years and the council can always revisit it if desired. Right. And I don't know if, um, Carly, if you're. If you you happen to be listening on, I don't know if you have immediate um, detail on that twenty one forty three. While I'm looking it up, but you may have you may be able to recall that. She must not be online. Pete Lieber, can I get you to put your hand down, please, on the computer? You. Yeah, I don't have that information. Sorry. All right. Thank you for that. Any more discussion around the table? Jason. Uh, yeah, just I, I did find that. So that twenty one forty three was the twenty seventeen to twenty one to twenty twenty one average minus seventeen percent. That was kind of predicted by the bag limit being put in place. So that does incorporate um, some of that expected reduction, but of course, we really haven't seen um, the results of it yet to know, like, you know, was it more or less than we originally estimated, which was, um, you know, we looked at what, what we had seen historically for um, kind of numbers of fish caught on wreck trips and then force them down to the new bag limit. So 
um, that's going to be a rough approximation. So the 2143 does have a bit of a reduction baked in, but we haven't seen the, um, the results yet. Let's see if we can make this vote an easy one. Uh, is there any objection to the motion? Are there any abstentions on the motion? Seeing none, the motion passes by unanimous consent. Jason, is there anything else on the Atlantic macro that we need to know? I think that's it, uh, Carly. I just, my, I was um, distracted by thinking about the rec set aside number searching. I think we, we don't need anything else for specifications, right? That motion covers us. Yeah, that should cover us. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Let's move on now to Golden Tile Fish, the Individual Fishing Quota Program, the 12 year review. Jose, Mid Atlantic Council staff, and Melissa Aaron from Northern Economics Inc. will be giving us a presentation. Whenever you guys are ready, the floor is yours. Thank you. We are ready. So today we're going to be talking about the Golden Town Fish uh, <clears throat> IFQ review. And basically, I'm going to go and uh, provide some background information on the catch share review program. And what are the current steps and next steps that we need to follow to uh, finalize this process? And then we're going to receive a presentation from Northern Economics on the review report itself. So the cash share policy from the uh, from NOAA indicates that all limited access privilege programs should be reviewed every five to seven years. The first review was conducted in 2017, and at that time we uh, evaluated the impacts of the IFQ. Uh, system on landings and fishery performance from 2010 to 2015. Then the council added a second review uh, into the 2023 implementation plan. Mm -hmm. The 2023 review that was put together by Northern Economics mostly uh, concentrates on impacts of the program on 2016 through uh, 2021. So we put together a team to provide oversight of the review report development. And this team was comprised of uh, council staff, CARFO and Northeast Fisheries Science Center uh, staff as well. And basically we kind of work along with Northern Economics to be sure that all the uh, parameters of the guidelines were met we facilitated data access through GARFO and, and the center and other needs that came along as Northern Economics developed this uh, review. So uh, this is the team that uh, did the work and they have substantial experience in cash share program reviews and other fisheries related issues. So uh, these are the team members. Melissa is sitting here to my right and she was the principal person uh, working with Northern Economics on this uh, project. So National Marine Fisheries Service has uh, uh, guidelines for conducting review of car cash share programs. And they basically include elements of um, key areas for review, things that must be addressed during the review uh, process. So we, we, we follow with those gui guidelines in developing this, this review. And they address biological, economic, social, administrative elements and other requirements that are in, 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 in that guidance document. So what are the next steps? Today, we're gonna get a presentation from Northern Economics, and this is gonna start a 30-day public comment period. Uh, we already put out a, a press release 
and we have a page uh, uh, for people to comment online on, on the council's website. So this, this comment period is gonna last uh, 30 days. Uh, it will close on January 12th. At that time, I will compile all the comments and summarize them. And then about a week after that, we're gonna have another meeting with the oversight uh, team and we're going to look at the comments. Then we're also going to look at uh, some of the recommendations that came out of the report. And we are then going to develop recommendations for the council to consider to see if the council want to take any actions to, to improve the, the, the way this fishery uh, uh, works. And that information will be presented to the council at the April uh, council meeting. So at that time, they uh, uh, will present all the oversight team recommendations uh, to the council. So that, that concludes my, my brief introduction. I don't know if you want me to take questions or wait until the end, Mr. Chair. We'll wait, we'll wait till the end. I'm afraid I won't be able to read my numbers uh, from that distance. So I'm gonna try to follow along on my own. All right, uh, thank you very much. My name is Melissa Arend, and as Jose already said, I'm an economist with Northern Economics and a lead author on the 12 year review of the Golden Tilefish IFQ program. Jose already did a really good job of giving an overview for the reasons that we are conducting this review and also the scope of the review. But just as a brief summary, uh, the first review was completed in 2017 and focused on the fish first six fishing years, 2010 through 2015. Uh, our review updates this through fishing year 2021, and the focus is really just to identify any major changes since the last review. In particular, if there's been any major changes with respect to meeting the goals and objectives initially laid out in the program. Uh, and as Jose mentioned, uh, our analysis focuses on a couple of key areas, economic outcomes, social and community impacts, biological impacts, and any administrative effects. As I mentioned, one of the key purposes of these reviews is to review any progress made to achieving the goals and objectives of the program. Uh, the first review did conclude that these goals had been met, uh, but for the sake of repeating them here and following along through the presentation to see if those conclusions still hold, uh, the primary goals that we were assessing were first to reduce overcapacity and latent fishing effort in the commercial fishery, and secondly, to eliminate to the extent possible the problems associated with derby style fishing. So today we're going to just focus on the highlights. It's a very long report, so we're going to keep it pretty simple and focus on the key uh, conclusions with respect to those goals and other key elements that came out of our report. And at the very end, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. So first, jumping into economic outcomes. We first start with just the most emergent changes that we saw at the fleet-wide level. And what we've seen is that the fleet in terms of the number of active IFQ vessels has continued to shrink. This was a conclusion in the first review that there had been a reduction from about 16 vessels to about 12 active vessels in the first six years. And we saw that this continued to decline between fishing year 2016 and fishing year 2021 to about eight vessels in each of the years since fishing year 2018. And largely, this is consistent with the goal of reducing overcapitalization. So it's uh, not concerning, and it's actually a positive thing that we've seen this continued decline. Other emergent trends that we've seen for the fishery include a reduction in total landed pounds in the fishery. And on average, this is a little bit lower than we saw in the first six years of the program. The first review concluded that there was an increase in both landings and in fleet light revenue. However, even though there's been a reduction in landings on average, we still see that on average fleet wide revenues have increased at least somewhat. And in particular, looking at revenues per vessel, we see that 
uh, this is considerably higher when considering that there's been a reduction in the number of active vessels in each of the last four fishing years. Another important thing to note is something that we see uh, with many of the economic indicators that we provided is that there was some bumpiness uh, between fishing year 2015 and fishing year 2017, where there was a steep decline in landings and in revenue in those years. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit more about what that was on the next slide. So you can really see that bumpiness really emerge in terms of utilization of the IFQ total allocation. So this figure shows the allocation in gray and fleet wide landings in blue. And so you can see that in a typical year, mostly the entire IFQ allocation is harvested. And in fishing year 2015, this was as low as 57%. So this is quite anomalous and it has recovered since, but as discussed in the first re review and in some of the interviews that were conducted for this work, uh, largely this declining utilization was attributed to low catch per unit effort as well as some vessel inactivity in that year. Another key element that we sought to look at was how share ownership has changed since the implementation of the program and in particular over the last six years. What we saw is that the number of entities holding shares has continued to decrease from 13 in fishing year 2016 to about 10 in recent fishing years. Uh, however, this is still well above the entity share cap of 49%, which permits a minimum of three entities holding shares. In addition to looking at potential consolidation at the share ownership level, we can also look at how this has changed in terms of use across vessels. And so we can construct two economic indicators which look at this consolidation in terms of revenue across vessels. Uh, the first is the Gini coefficient, which is shown on the left-hand graph. And this is a measure of revenue inequality. So it ranges from zero to one, and where zero is perfect equality and one is perfect inequality. So a decline in the Gini coefficient means that earnings are more equally distributed across vessels in the fleet. Um, and the HHI, which is a measure of concentration in terms of revenue, um, ranges in much greater terms. So it goes up to 6,500, uh, where above 2,500 is considered to be highly concentrated. So an increasing trend, which we have seen just over the last handful of years, just a slight increase, though not a huge change, uh, means that earnings have become more concentrated. These results might seem a little counterintuitive, though how can we have earnings that are more equal and at the same time more concentrated? Uh, but this can be explained by the reduction in the number of vessels. So with small, low earning vessels dropping out of the fleet, uh, this has actually meant that earnings are more evenly distributed across the remaining vessels. But at the same time, there's still a few vessels in the fleet that out earn most of the other active vessels which keeps the HHI up and increases it over time. We can also look at the same indicators in terms of dealers and dealer purchasing. And uh, what we see is a very similar trend in terms of the Gini coefficients. So purchases have become more equal across dealers over time, and in particular over the last six fishing years. And the HHI has substantially decreased from the ranges of being highly concentrated to more moderate concentration levels. Uh, and this really stems from some of the changes that we'll go over later with respect to the distribution of landings across port areas, which has allowed the uh, amount of purchases across dealers to even out considerably. A really key result in the first review was that prices have increased under the IFQ program, which has really resulted in a lot of the revenue increases and benefits that we've seen as a result of the program. Uh, a new analysis that we added to this review was just looking at what these price changes have looked like at a monthly level. And what we really see is that while prices on average have increased by about 50 cents per pound, this is really attributed to revenue or, or price increases that we've seen in the first six months of the fishing year, where prices have increased by almost a dollar per pound. And the reason that we've seen these increases in the first six months of the fishing year really come from season length decompression, uh, largely attributed to previous part-time 
and tier two vessels that continue to fish in the fishery. Um, with the reduction of derby fishing conditions and race to fish incentives, these vessels are fishing much later in the fishing year and aren't um, racing to get their quota and make their landings early in the fishing year anymore. So we see that shift in landing, particularly for those part-time vessels. Another change to the report is that in addition to the indicator of productivity and productivity change, we also constructed an indicator of profitability change. Both indices look at inputs and outputs and the change in uh, input and output prices. Profitability just also takes into a little bit more account about what prices were like for the fishery. So what we see are really similar trends to some of the other economic indicators, which is on average, both have increased, though there was a sharp decline during that fishing year 2015 to 2017 period. On average, though, profitability is 67% higher than it was under the baseline period, and productivity is still 37% higher than it was. We also constructed a accounting-based indicator of profitability. Uh, to look at how operating costs in particular have changed over time. And as shown in the middle graph, what we see is that operating costs have increased on average by about $20,000 per year, but revenue gains, particularly on the vessel level, have greatly outpaced any operating cost changes. So net operating revenue is still around $100,000 greater at the vessel level. Transitioning to social and community impacts, we'll present some of the information that we have available at the community level. When we look at the concentration of IFQ shareholdings across port areas, we see that three port areas really jump out as accounting for the majority of shareholdings in the fishery. Uh, in the first review, this was, didn't change at all. Uh, Montauk was the dominant port by shareholdings followed by Hampton Bays at Barnegat Light at equal contributions, but only in fishing year uh, 2017 did this shift a little bit with Montauk reducing its shares. And then again in uh, fishing year 2018, where some quota moved from some minor port areas into Hampton Bays. Following the trend in share ownership, we also see that in terms of landings, Montauk is the dominant port. It has been historically and it continues to be, though this proportion has decreased as shareholdings have moved out of that port area. Another new indicator that we added to the report looks at community dependence, which is just the proportion of total golden tilefish landings, including incidental landings, to all other species that are landed in that port area. Uh, we see that this hasn't changed a lot for Montauk, which is the most dependent port area, that it's on average around 20% of its total species revenue comes from golden tilefish. Similar for Barnegat Light, it's not as dependent. It's about 5% of total species revenue. Uh, but for Hampton Bays, which has increased its shareholdings, this has accounted for a higher proportion of total species landings in recent years, um, approaching 20%. As I mentioned briefly earlier, in addition to just crunching a lot of numbers, we did actually uh, make it out and talk to a bunch of program participants and other community members about their perspectives about how the program is performing. And by and large, what we heard in these interviews is that people feel like the program has really worked uh, to stabilize landings throughout the fishing year, giving them flexibility to fish when it's best for them, particularly for those that fish in other fisheries. And it, as a result of these two factors, it has really worked to increase prices. And just in general, a sentiment that people feel like they're better off under the IFQ program than they were under the previous tier system. However, similar as was noted in the first review, there are participants or former participants who feel like they would like to increase participation in, under the program, but simply can't acquire enough quota to do so, either through buying or leasing quota to enter the fishery. And for others, they feel like this was really attributed to the initial allocation of shares, um, which has made it very difficult for them to re-enter or increase their effort levels in the fishery. 
Looking at some of the other impact areas that we go over in the report, uh, one element was fishing vessel safety and other IFP programs. This has really been held up as a huge benefit of similar programs uh, coming out of derby style fishing conditions since people no longer have the incentive to fish in poor weather conditions. However, in this fishery, we don't have quite as much data to evaluate these changes, but a really good signal is that we didn't find any evidence that there have been any safety incidents in the last six fishing years. With respect to administrative impacts, we also looked at enforcement violations and similarly found no enforcement violations with respect to vessels who fish in the fishery and cost recovery fees has remained relatively low over time, around 0.5% um, of X vessel revenue. Biologically, we didn't expect there to be any positive or negative impacts of the IFQ program. Uh, and what we've seen are generally uh, neutral outcomes. Uh, there haven't been any ACL exceedances since the early years of the IFQ program and discards and catch of other species continue to be low. In addition, we looked at potential impacts to the other sectors that catch golden tilefish, uh, the incidental fishery and the recreational fishery. And in both, we don't find any evidence that there have been any negative impacts. And in some cases, we did find um, some discussion that there might be some positive benefits. So the incidental fishery might positively benefit from the IFQ program since they're able to land small quantities of golden tilefish so they can add this to their portfolio and potentially use that as an opportunity to enter the fishery formally through leasing shares if desirable. And likewise, for the recreational fishery, recreational fishers might benefit uh, simply because commercial fishermen have the flexibility to time their operations more effectively around recreational effort. The study team didn't have any major recommendations for changes to the IFQ program coming out of the review, though we did note that one minor consideration is that the fishery is getting increasingly small. So non-confidential representations of fishery data is becoming increasingly constraining. And this is particularly true at the community level, where as you can see even just from this few visualizations that I showed today, it's very hard to show um, with groups that are greater than three vessels or three dealers in any instance. So a recommendation that we had is that before the next review, it might be worthwhile to convene a panel of council and NOAA fisheries staff to get together to talk about um, what potential solutions, are there alternative metrics and indicators that might be worthwhile being put together that could track changes in the fishery of interest without showing and relying on that confidential data since you know, there are indicators like the profitability and productivity index and other ones that don't necessarily rely on showing exact figures. So things like that might be worthwhile to explore. So overall, uh, we conclude that yes, indeed, the goals of the program continue to be met. We see continued evidence of reductions in overcapacity with reductions in the number of active vessels and entities holding shares and uh, all of the benefits of eliminating the derby style fishing conditions continue to be achieved with effort being spread out across the fishing year. Prices remain high compared to baseline. And we heard in fishery interviews that participants are really reaping the benefits of increased flexibility to time their landings and avoid market gluts. So finally, I just wanna say thank you to everyone who contributed to this report, in particular the industry and community members who spoke with us to provide really valuable context and information. And of course, all of the really valuable insights and analyses that were provided by the oversight team members. So thank you. And with that, I'll take questions or back to Jose. Any questions? Comments? Adam Nowoski. Thank you. Is there any consumer benefits element of this report specifically when one looks at consolidation of a fleet in less ports and or profitability increases that could result in less access to a consumer, higher transportation costs resulting in higher end costs to a consumer? 
I can try to answer, but feel free to clarify if I don't quite get there. So one consumer benefit that we outline in the report mostly comes from the fact that you see increased prices. And my colleague and I had a debate about this, like increased prices, like is that really a consumer benefit? But really when you think about it, it is a consumer benefit because it's matching demand. And what we heard from industry members is that they've really been able to take advantage of these market conditions to generate a higher end product. So the price increases that you're seeing are the result of it being put into restaurants and to fit consumer needs that otherwise couldn't have been met under the previous derby conditions, which would have had a lower quality product that um, would be just pushed basically into the market. So that's what we see as like a major consumer benefit to this, this fishing program is better ability to meet consumer needs and preferences. Any more comments or questions around the table? Seeing none, thank you very much. 30-day uh, comment period ends January 12th, I think. Is that correct? Yep. All right, thank you very much. Let's go to our final agenda item of the day. There are 2024 implementation plan. Chris Moore, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If uh, you can pull up that presentation, Stephen. You. So for the next 20 minutes or so, I'll be talking about not only 2024, but also 2023. The emphasis, of course, is on 2024. Um, this is a, uh, the objective today is to approve a 2024 implementation plan to guide our activities for next year. I think most folks around the table recognize this is the second time that we've talked about this this year. We had the conversation in October with the executive committee. Uh, they proposed a draft for your consideration. That draft was included in the briefing book, along with a number of other documents that hopefully you have a chance to look at. Uh, what I'm going to do is move through uh, a number of slides highlighting uh, what we did in 2023 and then get into the 2024 discussion. Um, typically, what I do as I, go, as I go through this is I stop ask for questions and comments. But what I think I'm going to do is basically go through the 2023 review and then ask, stop, and see what folks have to say about that and then get into the 2024 conversation. But go through the entire plan because uh, there has been some things that have happened since the executive committee met that would change uh, some of the things in the uh, plan. So we need to consider those uh, today. So with that, uh, we'll get started. The, um, go to the next slide. The document uh, that uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at many times is the 2020-2024 strategic plan. The strategic plan was developed uh, a number of years ago to guide our activities over a five-year period. Uh, the reason that I bring this up is because it's an important document. The reason that we have discussions about implementation plans is because we have a strategic plan. Next slide. You haven't had a chance to look at the strategic plan in a while. Uh, at least take, take a look at the uh, two pager that's included in the briefing materials. This is the uh, strategic plan overview for the years uh, 2020 to 2024. Uh, some folks may have forgotten. We have a mission statement, uh, we have vision statement, and we have core values that are included in the plan. They're all very important. And then uh, the plan details another, a number of goals and objectives that uh, guide our activities. The um, annual implementation plans basically provide a link between uh, the five-year strategic plan and our council uh, activities for the year. And uh, we've said this before, it's a tool for planning at the beginning of the year, tracking throughout the year, and reporting at the end of the year. So with that, I'm going to move into 2023. Uh, and we do this 
and I'll do this relatively quickly because I've already done it once. I did it with the executive committee back in October, so I don't need to emphasize a, a lot of it. And certainly, I'm not going to read everything that's in the in the document uh, to you. But I do it just to remind folks of what we accomplished in 2023, what you all accomplished in 2023, and it actually helps set the stage for 2024 as well. So uh, if you look at uh, the council actions that we took in 2023, or we'll complete uh, this week, uh, we have, we initiated a recreational measures setting process framework addenda, because it was with the board. Uh, we have a separation, a species separation requirement uh, amendment in process or uh, in progress for surf climate ocean quahogs. We talked about the recreational sector separation catch accounting amendment at this meeting. The, uh, I'm sorry, not that, the, uh, this particular amendment was delayed. So this is something that uh, we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, we've had this on our plate for a couple of years and it was delayed in 2023 and we didn't take any action on it. Uh, we do have it on our schedule for 2024. We have a sturgeon bycatch framework in progress. Uh, we've talked about the FH amendment that's in progress. Took final action on the LX vessel hold capacity framework. And we took action on Atlantic macro emergency action request. Uh, staff just made a number of stock assessments. You see the research track uh, assessments there for those species. Also management track assessments for those other species. Uh, like we do every year, involved in specifications. Uh, we had uh, uh, multi-year specifications for a number of species, including some of Flanders scup. Uh, looked at uh, black sea bass for 2024, bluefish, Atlantic mackerels, money dogfish, and squid. Also, uh, specification reviews for those species that you see up there. Uh, like every year, uh, we are involved in a number of other projects and initiatives, including an evaluation of the SCUP GRAs. It's an important evaluation, one that we hadn't done for a while. Uh, we talked about the summer flounder minimum mesh size regulations and exemptions at this meeting. I passed that motion yesterday, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we just completed that uh, IFQ program review. Uh, consideration of the RSA program redevelopment was something we did this year. Did a uh, comprehensive review, comprehensive review of EAFM risk assessment. Um, I think folks remember our involvement with East Coast Climate Change Scenario Planning. Uh, we had the uh, completed this week the exempt and fishing permit review policy process guidance document. Uh, National, we were involved with the National Fishing Effects Database. Also, uh, spent a lot of time talking about 304F. Talk about 304F again tomorrow folks that uh, interested. Um, we're also involved in some science research activities, including the 2023 Golden Tilefish Survey. Uh, we are involved with the South Atlantic Deepwater Longline Survey expansion. We uh, extended an LX contract in support of ABC setting for LX. We're involved with electric electronic monitoring project for surf clams and ocean quags, as well as a supplemental surf clam genetics project. Um, we also were involved with uh, or had an SSC ecosystem work group and also involved with a project involving short term forecast of species distributions. We also uh, conducted a number of reviews and updates. There's a list here uh, commercial landings of unmanaged species. We'll talk about that every year. Uh, we've been talking about this every year as well, the private recreational tile dish permitting and reporting, how that's going or not going. The uh, 2023 State of the Ecosystem Report is something we've talked about. We always talk about offshore wind, we'll be talking about it again. So we have updates uh, continuously on that, as well as habitat updates by uh, Garfo and uh, our staff. This is a long list of all the the comments, not all of them, but most of them that made relative to a number of subjects. I'm not going to read you these just to give you a flavor. We are involved with Hudson Canyon Sanctuary. Uh, we sent a letter in regarding the NOAA seafood strategy implementation. Uh, we had uh, a letter that we sent to Senator Blumenthal regarding the SHIFT Act. Um, 
to NIMS regarding uh, a, an ANPR for National Standards 4, 8, and 9. And again, comments on the 304F procedural directive that we'll talk about uh, again tomorrow. Here are all our offshore wind comments. Those that are interested. If you're interested in any of the specifics relative to, related to any of them, you certainly can take a look at uh, our web website to uh, look at the details for those. So that is a quick review, overview of what we did in 2023. And we'll stop here for questions or comments. Again, we got a lot done. A lot on that list. And uh, certainly uh, there's plenty to do, that's for sure. We're going to be talking about what we're going to be doing in 2024. But again, very uh, proud of the council, the staff, for all the hard work, everything that we got done in 2023. Again, any questions or comments relative to what I presented? Okay, seeing no questions or comments, let's get into 2024 implementation plan. So, like I said earlier, we had a, a draft document that was approved by the executive committee in October. What you see behind the tab is what they approved, but we do need to make some changes to that document today. And I'll outline from my perspective, we need to make changes to that document today. Of course, it's up to you. So I'll outline, um, go through the entire draft, get back to specifics related to some of the things that need to be modified from my perspective for 2024. So let's start with uh, my favorite species, summer planter scup black sea bass. Uh, this is what we propose for 2024. Again, we've been involved in specifications, 2025 black sea bass, 2025 summer planter and scup specifications review, uh, 2025 black sea bass recreational management measures, uh, 2025 summer planter and scup and, uh, recreational management measures review, uh, we'll continue our work on recreational measures setting process framework agenda as discussed uh, today. The recreational sector separation or recreational catch accounting amendment, we'll continue work on that. Again, we didn't make much progress on that in 2023. We expect to uh, pick that up in 2024. Uh, like every year, we involved in advisory panel fishery performance reports. Um, also, we expect that we'll be supporting Black Sea Bass Management Track Assessment that uh, Julia talked about uh, today. Um, we'll also, uh, also on our list is a framework action to consider modifications to commercial scup gear, restricted areas, or other measures to help reduce scup discards. And we also uh, have indicated that uh, we uh, will be involved with a scup bycatch prediction and avoidance modeling and research. That would be under contract. So that's summer flounder scup and black sea bass. Moving on, bluefish, uh, 2025 bluefish spec review, uh, 2025 recreational management measure review, and advisory panel fishery performance reports for bluefish. Note there references the other items that were in five and six of summer and flounder scup and black sea bass, but also apply to bluefish. Just talked about golden uh, tilefish, but Golden blue line tilefish. We will be looking at 2025 to 2027 golden tilefish specs, 2025 blue line tilefish specs, advisory panel uh, fishery performance reports. Again, the update on private recreational tilefish permitting and reporting. Uh, we'll be looking at strategies to improve compliance with recreational tilefish permitting and reporting requirements. That would be something that we'd, we'd do under contract. Uh, Bluefish tilefish operational assessment support, as well as golden tilefish research track assessment support, and golden tilefish management track assessment support. We'll also uh, be uh, supporting the South Atlantic Deepwater Long Line Survey expansion into the Mid Atlantic waters. A uh, number of things on the list relative to squid butterfish, including 2025 2026 butterfish specifications. A review of 2025 Atlantic mackerel, chub mackerel, longfin squid, and nilix squid specifications, uh, advisory panel reports, uh, butterfish management track assessment support, 
long pin squid research track assessment support uh, in support of two projects related to squid, long pin squid uh, biological sampling, and also a squid modeling project. River Herring and Shad, two uh, contracts there. River Herring and Shad data portal development project, as well as a River Herring and Shad bycatch prediction and avoidance modeling and research project. Spiny dogfish, we talked about that today. Uh, 2025 spiny dogfish specs, advisory panel reports, aging project for spiny dogfish, uh, support of an aging workshop as well for spiny dogfish, and uh, something we'll talk about uh, more tomorrow, joint framework action to reduce Atlantic sturgeon bycatch in the monkfish and spiny dogfish fisheries. Surf climate and ocean quags, specifications review in 2025, our 2025 surf climate and ocean quag specifications review, advisory panel reports, uh, support of a management track assessment for surf clams, uh, two projects uh, under contract, uh, electronic monitoring project, as well as a supplemental surf clam genetics project. And uh, continuing the surf climate and ocean quag species, species separation amendment. Um, that, uh, that particular amendment uh, is something we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, we expect that uh, we'll be looking at a uh, public hearing draft for that particular amendment in uh, February. We'll talk more about that as well. Science and research, uh, we have a couple of things here. Uh, we need to develop our 2025 to 2029 council research priorities. Um, we will be updating the SSC's overfishing limit coefficient of variation guidance document. Continue our support of the supplemental port biological sampling as well as a fish aging project. Continue to coordinate and facilitate Northeast uh, NTAP, Northeast Trawl Advisory Panel. In terms of the ecosystem and ocean planning habitat, a number of, item, a number of items there as well. Uh, continue to maintain that uh, web page that we have with the New England Fishery Management Council. Uh, we will continue to develop council comments on habitat and fishery issues related to offshore energy development. We have a 2024 EAFM risk assessment report we're working on. We'll continue under contract working on the National Fishing Effects Database Project. Uh, continue our work on essential fish habitat amendment. Um, we will be involved with NERA maintenance and integration of products. And uh, we will uh, comment on exempt fishing permit applications for forage amendment ecosystem component species like thread herring. Some general things here as well. Uh, we um, develop another strategic plan. This will be our third, 2025 to 2029. Uh, we also need to reappoint all of our advisory panels. So that's a good job. We'll get an update on the uh, commercial landings of unmanaged species including consideration of possible landing threshold. I'll continue our uh, work participation on the CCC working groups and subcommittees. Uh, we'll continue our participation in marine mammal tank reduction teams, and uh, we will continue to support marine stewardship council certification audits, council managed species, and continue to track any important legislation that uh, we need to relative to the council or the Magnuson Act. We have a new uh, category, uh, climate resilience and governance. We'll do a program review of council GARFO processes for fishery management action uh, development. We talked about that this week. Got to meet, uh, hopefully you had a chance to uh, talk with our contractors and uh, meet them. Um, we are um, evaluating council committee structure use and decision-making. It's one of the action items that came out of the uh, scenario planning work that, uh, that we did. Uh, also, activities related to IRA-funded projects, IRA-funded projects for climate-ready fisheries. And this is a big one that uh, we'll talk more about tomorrow, but uh, basically uh, councils have been given money, or uh, there's money has been set aside for council uh, proposals and projects, and uh, that will involve, even though that's money that's coming from NIMS, uh, we basically expect that there'll be some staff time and resources associated with the management uh, of those particular projects. 
communication and outreach, ongoing communication activities to support understanding and awareness of the council, uh, outreach campaigns to increase stakeholder awareness, and uh, continue our council website improvements. Uh, last item here is to uh, wrap up any actions that are outstanding from 2023. So that would be finalizing our specification packages that some of which we talked about today for 2024. It's a list of possible additions, so certainly we can spend some time here. Uh, we've talked about why we have a possible additions list. And uh, there's one, two, three, four, five, six items here. Uh, these are some of these items are, are items that we've carried over from 2023. Some of them are new. Uh, but basically, uh, the bottom line with these are that, in fact, if we have time or additional uh, we'll spend the money on contracts, potential for us to uh, basically address any of those items that you see on this list. So with that, I'm going to stop. I went through those very quickly. And I did it quickly because we've already talked about those. The executive committee, a number of you were there. I think most of you were at that at the executive committee meeting. Certainly, um, you know, I think in terms of going back through any of these slides, we certainly can do that. I expect that we will have uh, some questions. But before I do that, I know that there's at least one or two folks around this table that are very interested in hearing how we plan to deal with the motion that, uh, that we approved yesterday related to the summer flounder fly net and small mesh exemption framework that uh, the council and the uh, board adopted. So this is the motion that uh, was made yesterday, uh, basically to consider it as a potential 2024 pri uh, priority. Um, and to clarify the definition of a fly net, consider moving the western boundary of the small mesh exemption area. And what we what we are proposing at this point, given that particular motion, is if you could, Mary, go back to the summer fly net scuff black sea bass slide. So basically, looking at our activities here, if you look at, you can go down through one through eight, um, well, actually, let me say this. So if you look at number six, recreational sector separation or recreational catch accounting amendment, we say that's continuing. We said that we we're gonna pick that up in 2024. And that's basically something that uh, Kylie's going to lead. One of the things that we can take off the list, from my perspective, is number nine, because we don't have at this point the research, the information to basically pose any alternatives to current GRAs. So the first thing we'd have to do is number 10, right? So it's a little confusing, but what I'm proposing is that we delete nine from the list, add the framework that we adopted yesterday to this list, so we'd still have 10 items. The issue that, uh, that we need to consider is the timing issue relative to the framework that we adopted yesterday. So remember the language, we basically we said we need to do this and that, to have this thing done by November. So, in order for that to happen, in order for us to even consider the possibility of that happening by November, we'd have to push back on the account, the catch accounting amendment that's detailed in number six. Push back means instead of looking at scoping early in 2024, make that later in 2024. So that Kylie could have the time to basically address the framework that we uh, adopted yesterday, that makes sense. So that's that's a significant change to this list. And that's that's really the only significant change to the document that I have at this point. However, again, there's comments, questions relative to the other things we can talk about it. And if anyone thinks that, that any of the stuff that we've listed in possible additions needs to move up in the list, we need to consider what we need to drop in order for that to happen. 
So with that, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm glad to take any questions that folks have. Mike Petney. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just kind of curious, Chris, and, and how you laid that out, um, whether you want to entertain motions, because I have a motion queued up to the effect of your recommendation related to the blind and small mesh exemption area. So um, we could do that. We could we could take it as an individual item, or we could just consider what's being proposed as a change to the document. At some point, I'm going to need a motion basically endorsing what we have for 2024. So it'd be something like, you know, I support the 2024 implementation plan as discussed today with the possible with the changes related to that particular framework. So it's up to you. We could do it in. Two steps, we can do it in one step. Yeah, whatever. I would, whatever pleases the council. I would say it's up to you. So you're oh. on the show. If you want, if you prefer to have a motion on the record that we're making the change for nine for the yesterday's framework adjustment, we can do that. If uh, everybody agrees that that's informally that that's the approach, I, then yeah. we'll not need a So, given that you've already have one teed up, given that there's some concern about not putting it on the list, apparently, why don't you go ahead and make the motion? All right, Chairman, that's okay. Go ahead. All right, thanks, Mr. Chairman. So I have a motion queued up. Hopefully, Mary, you have this. Um, I move to replace summer flounder scup and black sea bass item number nine, framework framework action to consider modifications to the commercial scup gear restricted areas, with the framework adjustment to address the summer flounder small mesh exemption area and fly net definition and associated issues, as agreed unanimously by the council and board. I get a second. I have a bit of a rationale, which is probably pretty clear. <laughs> um, so yesterday, obviously, the council and the board unanimously supported consideration of a new priority to develop and implement by November 1st, 2024, a new framework adjustment to consider moving the western boundary of the summer flounder small mesh exemption area and also to clarify the regulatory definition of a fly net along with several associated issues, such as the enrollment period, the evaluation criteria. We understood at the time that yesterday's motion would be followed today with a motion to make this action a priority, not just something to consider. So if this motion passes and the framework adjustment is added to the list of 2024 priorities in place of item nine, um, then I presume we'll need a follow on motion after the priorities discussion to actually initiate the framework so that the February council meeting can be formally noticed as the first framework meeting and hopefully keep us on track for November 1st implementation next year. Thank you. Mary. Can we, can you just check and make sure the wording is correct? Cause I think the way you read it was slightly different than the motion that I had received previously. So I just want to make sure I have it right on the board. Exactly what I read into the thing. So I was I was reading the email that I sent you. So I don't know what you were looking at, but sorry. <laughs> I had sent you two emails. One had had exactly what I just read into the record with the rationale. Stephen, I think maybe the um, document up there is not syncing with um, the changes I'm making on my end. I don't know if you can close it and reopen.
sorry, that's that's still not the right one. Uh, Why we're waiting? Yes, exactly. While we're waiting, we have often moved something in the past from proposed additions up higher, and then what was on the deliverables list would wind up in proposed additions. In this case, the way the motion reads, um, we're saying we're replacing number nine. Does that imply that we're going to move nine into? Possible additions because it's not clear what happens with nine at this point. Chris? Yeah, exactly. But thanks for bringing that up, Adam. It's exactly what, you know, it's implied, but because of the way we've done it in the past, but certainly bringing it up today is it's a good thing. I'm glad you said that. So, you know, folks need to understand that if we replace that SCUP DRA framework with this framework, then the SCUP DRA framework goes to the bottom and we just track it. I don't expect we'll be taking any action on it in 2024, but certainly having it there for, for consideration uh, later in 2024, if in fact we get some time, would be something that uh, we want to do. Michael Lisi. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think while well, as we're waiting for this, um, could I ask the maker or somebody around the table to just help me understand? Um, not only is this a new item that's being brought into the 2024 implementation, but it it's kind of taken a taking a front seat to everything else. Can someone explain the need for expediting this and getting this done as quickly as it was discussed yesterday? Is there if somebody could just help me understand, that would be great, Mike. Mike Bennett. Yeah, so I think you know we heard yesterday in the in the review of three issues that the that the council asked for a review. One was the the summer fund or minimum mesh sizes and the distinct you know, differences or potential difference between square and the mesh sizes. Um, and then we heard uh, an evaluation of the flynet exemption program and the small mesh exemption area program. Uh, we heard how valuable they are to the industry. There's, a, there's uh, you know, a lot of interest in um, in making sure that those are accurately representing the intent of the council and the agency. But there's a few issues related to the the, the uh, spatial extent of the small mesh exemption area that would make it more effective uh, for the industry with with uh, seemingly, although it needs to be analyzed, seemingly minimal concern for additional discard of summer flounder. Um, but then also some confusion um, around the, the definition of a fly net uh, as it is described in the regulations. And so uh, the program currently runs November 1st through April 30th of each year. So we're in the middle of the program right now. There's no hope in making corrections or adjustments for the current uh, fishing year. Um, but there is an opportunity, I think, to make the adjustments uh, that people want for the next opportunity, which would be November 1st, 2024. And because it's a short term uh, issue, if we don't make the fix in time, you know, effectively for the 2024 cycle, it would be November 1, 2025. Um, and so I think there's some urgency in the sense that we can relatively straightforward it seems although again the reason for a framework adjustment is to make sure we're not missing anything uh, but clarify the definition of a fly net so everybody understands what gear they should be using um, that complies with the, the intent uh, and then also make potentially make some area changes to the small mesh exemption program uh, to address some of the concerns and the issues that the industry has raised and then as noted yesterday i think adam raised it there's a couple of associated issues like uh, some confusion about the enrollment period and whether trips can occur uh, out you know, west of the area during the enrollment period or not. So we'd, we'd like to clarify that for the industry, uh, as well as to address the, uh, the 
the uh, evaluation criteria as they're currently described in the FM in the regs, which again may not be consistent with the council's intent. So there's just a number of things that I think uh, the industry would like uh, and that we would like to clarify and, and make sure where everybody understands uh, you know what's necessary and what's required. And uh, given the November 1st start of the next cycle, we thought that it made sense to try to get that done uh, in time for that. Mary, that was seconded also by Peter Hughes. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, mean, I don't have much to add to what Mr. Penny just said, and I agree with it 100%. Um, you know, the, it's a modernization of reality. We're adjusting regs to what reality is now. The fishery has changed, the gear has changed. We're talking about rope nets now with eight to 10 foot meshes. They were mentioned yesterday, Mr. Farnham mentioned today under dogfish. So it's a modernization and it's, it's well overdue. We've been actually talking about this particular topic for some time. And now we're finally doing something about it. So I, I, I really appreciate that. And I will point out that uh, as far as flu, uh, fluke scup and sea bass goes, there are four priorities that are common to both sectors. Item one, item two, item seven, and item eight. The rec sector has four priorities that are specific to them, item three, four, five, and six. The only commercial specific priority will now be the replacement of item nine. And I think that we can at least help the commercial sector and spend some time helping them in 2024 and get the job done. Thank you. Dan Farnham. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick, quick addition to that. And don't forget the, the commercial sector has taken it's taken quite a, a hit in the available quota next year too. Um, I have forty percent, forty two. I forget what the percentage is. The idea behind this too is also to turn some of these discards into landings through this program too. Thank you. Seeing no more discussion around the table. Oh, Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I, I supported this motion when we discussed this yesterday. Um, I still support it. I am a little concerned about the, I mean, I realize something's got to give, but pushing back on the um, sort of the time frame for the catch accounting and sector separation amendment, I just hope it doesn't slide off the edge of the table this year. You know, I think you've heard frustrated comments from you know, a number of folks in the for hire sector. And so I, I think we need to make sure that we keep that on the table, even if it's uh, um, delayed in, in its time frame. Thanks. Michelle, you wanna put your hand down? Let's see if we can pass this by consent. Are there any objections to the motion? Seeing none, any abstentions? Motion passes by unanimous consent. Chris. So with that, we have modification to the document. Basically switching out one framework for another. Talked about what that means in terms of timing for catch accounting amendment, as Michelle just uh, discussed. So with that, I think we're done with summer fly scup and black sea bass. My perspective, but if there's anything else that, that we need to talk about relative to those particular species, now would be a good time to bring them up. And uh, as you're thinking about those, think about the other uh, things that we have on the list. Again, uh, if there's any questions or comments about those things, we'd be glad to, uh, to answer those today as well. And if there are none, and as I indicated earlier, the motion is, I think, Mike, you said it, uh, we need to initiate framework. You're expecting that initiation to happen today, or are you going to wait till? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I agree. So we need uh, basically a motion from the council indicating that with the one change that we've made, that uh, we're ready to go with this document. So that's one, and then after we get done with that, we'll talk about the uh, initiation of the framework. 
Mr. Chair. Would that motion? Yeah. Okay, I'd like to move to approve the 2023 implementation plan as modified today, 2024. Just reading what I was handed. <laughs> yeah, Peter Hughes. Thanks. I want to address the motion or the discussion that we had back in uh, Manhattan at our last meeting, and I believe it's the last bullet point on your presentation has to do with VMS and getting a better understanding um, from enforcement and how VMS, um, how it's being utilized uh, today, as it has certainly changed considerably over the course of the last 10 years and what it used to be um, to what it is today. Um, that motion was uh, made at the New England Council last week. It was approved by the New England Council. They are going to reach out to an enforce to enforcement to um, plan a meeting. Uh, I believe in the first quarter of 2024. Uh, I think it's important that this council have a better understanding. This enforcement committee on our council have a better understanding of how VMS can work, um, how how the whole system works um, because it's, it's it's no longer what it used to be and i have a lot of questions in regards to that you know uh, maybe you know a lot of the fisheries under this in this council aren't required to have vms requirements or reporting requirements or something but there are fisheries that have a lot of those um, and things have changed and and i'd like to move that above the line from where it is so that we can have those conversations in tandem with the new england council because why should we have them twice when we can have them once and iron everything out? Um, so thanks. So probably should have talked about that before we even got to yeah. this. So let's 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 back up. I know, I know, Peter. Yeah, let's back up. Let's go to I'll just uh, possible. Let's go to the possible addition list, Mary, so we can see exactly what uh, slide 30, I think. So here's the list of possible additions. If you look at uh, 74, that's the one you're referring to, Peter, right? And uh, we put this uh, on as a possible addition at our executive after our executive committee meeting, based on the conversation that uh, that we had there, and we're waiting for the New England Council to indicate what they were going to do, because I think folks were convinced that in fact yes, it's a good idea to work with the New England Council. If they're going to do it, we should probably be involved as well. So now Peter's telling us that in fact they are going to do something with it. So I'm assuming that this is on their implementation plan for 2024, and what I need to understand at this point is what the expectation is for staff and our council relative to this particular action. Is it just tracking it or is it an actual, is it gonna be a framework? Is it gonna be something that uh, involves staff analyses? I'm not sure. Peter? Thank you. I don't, re I don't believe that it's a framework. I, I think it's going to invite and uh, you uh, in the enforcement committee, uh, whoever's the head of that committee. It's so it's going to require a bit of staff time, um, uh, and I think it's just participating in a meeting, and and maybe a follow up meeting, um, because there's going to be questions asked out of the enforcement committees um, of enforcement that they're probably going to have to come back and answer. Um, so I don't believe that it's a real heavy lift. I think it's just understanding how VMS works. And I give you an example, if you'd like. A scallop boat would go out fishing. If he entered the line into an access area where he wasn't supposed to be, we got a phone call. Didn't matter if it was two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, we got a phone call. That boat had to return immediately to the dock. 
When that boat returned to dock, 100% of its trip was confiscated immediately. No questions asked. That's not the case today. Boats are going in and out of the line, popping in and out of the line. You'll hear that on my report tomorrow on the scallop report. We're instituting a five minute ping rate for our scallop boats now uh, so that we can watch them as they approach the line. A lot of people are cheating the system because enforcement no longer is utilizing VMS as its sole source of an enforcement action. It also has to visually see an action. There was a scallop boat that was recently uh, 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 out in closed area two. Uh, the VMS showed that he was going across the line. They flew their airplane out. It triangulated it, located it, marked it. The boat was told to go to the dock. The boat went to the dock. They confiscated the scallops, but not all of them. Why not? What's changed? I mean, I'm appreciative that they didn't do that, but where's the where's the disconnect? So there's a disconnect here on what what enforcement is doing and how they're going about doing it, and the changes, the evolutionary changes that have taken place over the last number of years from when VMS was instituted to where we are today. Not looking for stronger laws. I'm just looking to understand them. That's all. Chris? You. So uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, with that understanding, I don't think we have any problem moving it up to, I don't know what category we put that in. Which one would that go into? Yeah, general maybe. So, you know, we, yeah, I think folks know this. You know, I have a staff member assigned to New England activities, Jason, right? So he's tracking, he'll be tracking whatever New England does, including this. And it sounds like we may involve our, you know, law enforcement committee at some point as well. I think we could easily accommodate that in uh, 2024. So I would, I'm fine with moving up the list unless there's any opposition to, uh, to doing that. We'll, uh, we'll make that another change. Adam. Just to be clear with that, I think I changed the wording from it to reflect that we're tracking or something and not initiating the review. We're not doing the review ourselves. So I think just in addition to why you move it up to general, I trust staff can clean that up to reflect what we're actually doing so no one expects us to do the review ourselves. Good point. And Neil. Yeah, I, I wanted to make a comment on another these possible additions. Uh, number 72, which is yeah. uh, did not catch reports for the tile fisheries. You know, we, since I've been here, it's been complaining about the tile fish reporting and uh, the lack of. And until you do 72, you're spinning your wheels. Uh, and so it, it's just not going to work because you have no idea why I didn't report. Uh, did I not fish or, or am I breaking the law, you know, kind of thing. And so un until you do this, all this conversation we keep having every time about the blue bond tile fish reporting, it's, you're, you're not going to get it. So one of these days you're going to have to move that up. So um, I agree with you. We've been talking about did not fish reports for, I don't know, probably two, three, four years maybe. And I think we're actually getting some traction. Talked about it enough that we plan to have it on the agenda for our May NRCC meeting, if I remember correctly, to have a presentation by Garfo and the Science Center, basically to present an analysis of what what that means or what it could mean for the councils. So after we see that in May, that may stimulate some further conversations within the council, and maybe we pick it up for 2025. And more questions, comments around the table from the audience. Seeing none, Mike Belisi, do you have a motion to make now? We have a motion 
by Mike Goisi and seconded by Joe Green. Any comments, questions to the motion? And discussed on the motion? See if we can pass this by consent. Is there any objection to the motion? Any abstentions to the motion? Seeing none passes by unanimous consent. Now we have one more item to deal with, Mike Petney. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, as Chris mentioned, as, and as I uh, highlighted, I have a follow-up motion to the motion to change the priorities. So hopefully, Mary, you can find that email without breaking the motion system. There we go. Um, so I move that the council initiate a framework adjustment to address several issues related to the summer flounder commercial fishery, specifically to consider moving the western boundary of the small mesh exemption area, to clarify the regulatory definition of a fly net, clarify the requirements of enrolling in the small mesh exemption program, and to ensure meaningful and effective evaluation criteria for the small mesh exemption program and the use of the fly net exemption. Hopefully I'll get a second for that. You probably have heard the rationale three or four times now. Peter Hughes with a second. I think we've had enough discussion on this motion as well, Adam. Yeah, I just think it's important that the record reflect that this will require complementary action by the board. Uh, which I believe they're hoping to do through the policy board at their winter meeting at the ASMFC. So it's great that we're doing this, but this will be dependent on that action there as well. Chris Mark. Thank you. And to that, to that point, Adam, yesterday, I think you heard a brief exchange between uh, me and Tony regarding who's gonna do the work regarding this particular framework. So publicly, I wanna state that I will take advantage of the offer from the ASMSC folks to help us with this particular document and uh, hopefully get it done quicker. And more discussion on the motion? See if we can pass this one. Is there any objection to the motion? Any abstentions to the motion? Motion passes by unanimous consent. I believe that can finishes up all our agenda items for today. Thank you very much. And we will be back here tomorrow morning at nine o'clock and hospitality is in 2.30. All right, thank you all, see you tomorrow.